Welcome to Movie Case 2020. This is opening ceremony. I'm Hong Haogao from Shanghai University, and is a conference chair of this conference, Movie Case 2020. Okay, let me in- introduce Movie Case 2020. We received 49 paper and accept 15 papers. So,、uh, congratulations to all accept papers. Author, so I think movie case has become a good platform for research to exchange idea and show the new research. So thank you all of you to submit your paper to movie case 2020. Thank you. Although we have impact from the COVID-19, but we have a good way to、uh, hold the conference online. So thank you. And、uh, I would like to、uh, show the next year movie case twenty twenty one. Welcome everyone to submit paper again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the EAI Mobile Case 2020, the 11th EAI International Conference on Mobile Computing Applications and Services. I am Alexandra Szczeziowska, and I am the representative of EAI. Unfortunately, due to the virus, I am not able to meet all of you in person. So I am using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the authors, and participants on behalf of EAI. In particular, the general chairs, Professor Hong Hao Gao and Professor Ying Liu, and program chairs, Professor Ying Li, Professor Yu Yu Yin, and Professor Hong Qing Bi, for their hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of preparations. During today's event, there are truly many ways how you can collaborate with EAI, and we invite you to try this partnership. Please don't hesitate to reach out to my colleague Ms. Tin Tava if you are interested in cooperation in holding a conference or a workshop. You can see her email just below the video. EAI as well provides you with the opportunity to ask questions and participate in Q&A sessions through Slack. Upon accessing the link below for Mobicase 2020 workspace, you can enter all channels which are divided into sessions. Moreover, you can vote on the presentations and leave feedback on your fellow presentations. You will get to determine which presentation will be the best from this conference. We will shortly show you how you can access these platforms. In addition, I would like to mention that after my presentation, my colleague Michael will talk more about EAI tools and also go into more details about the affirmation voting, which you can make use of during this conference. To sum up, it is our honor to organize this year's edition of Mobicase. I hope you will have a wonderful time during this event and that you will follow the next edition in 2021. We will keep you posted, and the news about this event will be available on the conference website. We are looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the committee manager at EEI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference、uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EAI is a global community for a greener, healthier, and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries, and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world, thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. 
We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EEI Compass, Community Review, and EEI Index. Firstly, EEI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EEI Compass website, compass.eei.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019, and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course, and all EEI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EEI members and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks, senior member, distinguished member, or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we'll look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon. Hello, everybody. I'm Shui Guang Deng from Zhejiang University in China, and it's my great honor being here to give an online keynote in these special days during the pandemic of COVID-19. The topic today is uh, 
mobile service computing opportunities and challenges. The content I want to share with you include a brief overview of service computing, the concept, feature, and the challenges of mobile service computing, as well as some of our research and practice in this area. According to IEEE TCSVC, services computing is defined as a cross discipline that covers the science and the technology of bridging the gap between business services and IT services. In brief, it is a new distributed computing paradigm based on service-related technologies, including SOA, service mesh, microservices, and so on. Actually, service computing has been regarded as the supporting technology for the construction, operation, and management of large-scale internet services systems. The paper, A Service Computing Manifesto, the next 10 years, published on communication of the SM in 2017, tells us that services encompass concerns at all levels and service computing has a more and more important role to play in the year of uh, in the era of, of big data internet of thing and 5g we can understand the services computing from two different perspectives service coordination from the perspective uh, of distributed computing and service oriented methodology from software engineering perspective of course, you can also understand it from the other two perspectives like service provision and service consumption. This figure illustrates the research scope of, research of service computing inspired from the classic provider-consumer target triangle. We can roughly classify the research issues into these two categories. One is related to the goal to provide services efficiently and reliably. It includes service operations, service description, service quality, service privacy, and etc. And the other is to optimal and conveniently use services. It includes service discovery, selection, recommendation, composition, and so on. All of these Research issues can also be organized into different levels according to their outcomes, as shown in these two research framework. For example, the left free, uh, framework includes three layers that, uh, that are include description and the basic operations, composition and the management. The right figure shows the another framework which include four layers from bottom up include service resource layer, service convergence layer, service application layer, and service system layer. Service computing has attracted great attention worldwide both from academia and the industry. The focus of the research changed a lot during the past years. The editor-in-chief of the Atropy Transactions on Services Computing declared the seven different waves of service computing in 2014. That includes web services, social computing, mobile computing, enterprise computing, cloud services, big data, and IoT. And we also divide the research evolution of service computing into three stages. As this figure shows, the first stage is um, called models and standards stage, which is trying to answer the question, what is a service? During this stage, ended in 2007, all kinds of service models and standards like WISTO, BIPO, uh, SDO, and so on, were proposed. The second stage is trying to propose enabled methods to provide, deliver, and use services. A lot of methods came into being to help service selection, 
uh, discovery, composition, recommendation, and so on. Now we are on the road of the third stage. I call it service plus stage. That means we are trying to empower IoT, big data, social network, blockchain, AI, edge computing with service computing. From this keyword card figure generated from the titles of papers published during the past five years in service-related journals conferences, we can see that service computing with mobile, computing with big data, with LT, with social network are spinning up, are spinning up. So let's talk about mobile services computing, which represents one of the hottest research and application direction of Source Plus. Undoubtedly, we are now embracing and enjoying a year of uh, a year of mobile internet. As this statistic data early of this year shows globally more than five billion people now use mobile devices for fun for work and for social. On the other hand, we are witnessing the capability of mobile devices and the sensors integrated increasingly largely, increasing largely and quickly during the past years. That makes mobile devices can do a lot of things like collecting and sharing data resources and also providing services or content for people around. This brings us a new distributed computing paradigm called service mobile service computing, which combines service computing with mobile computing and it aims to deliver services to mobile users through cloud or edge or mobile devices or their hybrid combination. We can imagine some features of this paradigm includes mobility, mode access, location aware, resource restricted and hybrid computing. There are three different pattern, application patterns of mobile service computing, as this figure shows. The cloud to mobile device pattern represents the most popular style today, where mobile users enjoy the service and the content from cloud or edge cloud. The mobile-to-mobile -mobile or D2D pattern enable mobile users to establish a temporal, temporal P2P network among users around to share resources or complete collaboration. This pattern requires an incentive mechanism to stimulate the participation for mobile users. The third pattern is called hybrid pattern, which means services are delivered to mobile users through the hybrid combination of cloud edge and mobile devices. Actually, mobile service computing are still facing great challenges from the perspective of mobile service providers to provide stable, reliable and consistent services for a large amount of mobile users with the hybrid infrastructure of cloud, edge and mobile devices. It's still difficult, especially when considered con the uncertain mobility of users, the dynamics, dynamics of a network, the trade off among hybrid infrastructure, and also the willingness of mobile users. From the perspective of mobile users, how to select the best services and do scheduling and offloading is too difficult when considering the relatively limited capacity and power of mobile devices and also the complex tasks to be completed. During the past years, my research group has focused on these challenges and carried out a lot of practice and research on mobile source computing. The first work I want to talk is about service deployment redundancy. In the traditional cloud computing scenario, an application is often centralized and deployed as a whole on cloud. However, it, it will incur high latency and thus low quality of, ex, of experience for users, especially when big data are transferred. 
In this case, we can utilize the advantages from hybrid infrastructure based on cloud and edge. Even so, to gain an optimal deployment scheme on the hybrid infrastructure is not easy. Lots of factors should be considered comprehensively, such as the structure of the application, the resource requirement for each microservice, the network topology of the of the infrastructure, and also the available resources of each ad node. Here is a simple but a, but a real scenario in smart policy, where an application named Smart Detector is built with three microservices: face recognizer, illegal query, and auto alarm. Now, in order to guarantee the detector serve serve policeman with timely response, we need to deploy the microservices on the edge network with four different edge nodes while considering the computation and storage requirements of the microservices and also the, capa the, the capacity of each node as these two tables show. So, we set the goal of this problem as to minimize the deployment cost while satisfying the requirements of the latency of the application. And then formulate this problem as P1 so here. We propose the approach based on interior point method and the branch and bound method to gain the optimal solution. Furthermore, in order to guarantee the robustness and the performance of an application, redundancy strategies also should be considered. That means we can deploy more than one copy of each microservice on different edge nodes simultaneously while considering the capacity restriction of each node. Consider this application with the four microservices and the edge network connected by six different edges. A good redundancy strategy should gain the best performance of the application by deploying each microservice copies on product edge nodes with the consideration of different requests from mobile users. So we formulated the problem as P1 show here, and set the goal as minimizing the overall latency of the application, which consists of the uplink time consumption and downlink time consumption. We take the uncertainty of end user service request and also the heterogeneity of ad site into consideration and propose the sub algorithm to gain a suboptimal redundancy solution. Service selection composition is a pretty common topic in social computing. A lot of work has been done to help selecting and composing services based on users' different preferences like QS, quality of services. However, the constant mobility of mobile users brings great uncertainty suffered from unstable network connection and inconsistent quality of services. Traditional methods based on st static planning for selection and composition doesn't work well for this case anymore. As the left figure shows, the coverage and the strength of mobile signal differs largely in different uh, zones even at two locations nearby. It leads to different network transmission speed, which affect the quality of experience of mobile users greatly. Traditional QoS-driven method ignoring the dynamic network condition caused by the mobility results low quality of, of experience. In order to figure out this problem, we use random waypoint mobility model to depict the user's mobility and formulate the problem with the optimization goal as the best global quality of experience. 
a heuristic algorithm table is used to gain the solution. Experiments show that this method can improve QoE by 20% compared to traditional methods. The last topic I want to talk about is service of loading and scattering, which becomes more difficult in the scenario which with hybrid infrastructure than with the single traditional cloud computing. Because we have more targets to select to offloading to, but the capacity, cap but the cap capability and available resources differs a lot among cloud edge and device, and also among different edges. Furthermore, the cost of data transfer among distributed nodes will affect the efficiency of offloading and scheduling solution a lot. All of these factors should be taken into consideration before we gain an optimal solution. In most cases, this is proven to be MP hard optimization problem. Consider such a scenario showing this figure. Multiple mobile users collect data from uh, cans of sensors on mobile devices and uh, offload the data to edge servers nearby for analysis during a long time of period. As the users are moving constantly and randomly, each offloading decision should be location aware and support offloading to different edges simultaneously in order for all users to get the analysis result as soon as possible. For this case, we formulate the problem as minimizing the overall data analysis time and utilize Lyapunov optimization to decompose the long-term problem into each time slot. In each time slot, we proposed a sample and learning algorithm to solve the sub-problem. The experimental results show that our algorithm after performs on um, these benchmarks and it also performs well with the growing scale of mobile users. We also design the framework shown here to support the offloading. When tasks offloaded or dispatched to edge nodes, another issue arising is that how to schedule the tasks to ensure all the tasks could be executed, executed timely. Let's consider a, common, a more common case where an edge node was invaded with a mass of tasks in a sudden. This happens often in our daily life actually, like some sport even occurring. In this case, the node could not afford all the tasks and needed to evacuate most of the tasks to other nodes of the edge network. And furthermore, each ad node needs to schedule and complete all incoming tasks. We solve this problem by two steps. Firstly, we design an improved grid and free optimization algorithm to complete all evacuation in a minimum max span with the consideration of the available boundaries of the link between edge nodes. And then, the incoming tasks on each edge node are scheduled by a parallel strategy based on re-entrant line scheduling method to complete in the minimum time consumption. Experiments show our method after performs others in terms of max span. Alright, I'd like to stop here due to the limit of time. Here's some of our publication on mobile service computing and this is our newly published monograph on this year. Please feel free to contact me if you want to know more about our work and thanks for your attention and keep, and keep healthy during these special days. Thanks.
Hello everyone, it's my great honor to present our work here. I'm Hong Jingguo from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. The topic of our presentation is metamorphic testing for plant identification mobile applications based on test contests. First, let me present an overview of my presentation. In the first section, I will explain the background and motivation of our work. 
In the next section, I will summarize the existing work. In the third section, I'm going to show the details of our approach. Then, I will present the case study. The last section concludes our work and introduces our future research agenda. Over the past few years, significant progress in artificial intelligence has enabled the development of AI-based mobile apps, such as object recognition, navigation, and machine translation. Despite the tremendous convenience these apps bring to people's daily life, they still suffer from quality issues. For example, many AI-based apps show inconsistent results for two rounds with the same inputs when contests are changed. As a concrete example, here shows two images of the same plant taken by a tester from different angles, a 90-degree and a 45-degree angle from the smartphone plane to the plant, respectively. A plant identification app named PlantSnap identified figure A as a Lactoca virusa. It identified figure B as a Hydrangea microbial yellow. Different photographing angles of the same plant can even result in quite inconsistent behaviors. These quality issues undoubtedly affect the commercial success of apps. Therefore, testing AI-based apps becomes an important concern for developers. For traditional software, the program logic is manually written by developers, while AI software inherently follows a data-driven programming paradigm that constructs the internal decision logic through the large-scale training data. These features make quality assurance and validation of AI-based apps a challenging task for developers. One of the major challenges in testing AI software lies in the lack of test oracle. It refers to situations where it is extremely difficult or impossible to verify the test result of a given test case. Metamorphic testing has been widely used to alleviate the test oracle problem and test case generation. Central to MT is set of metamorphic relations. NMR refers to the relationship between the software input change and output change during multiple program executions. For example, to test the function sign x, one may check how the output changes when the input is changed from x to pi minus x. If sin x differs from sin pi minus x, this observation signals an error without needing to examine the specific values computed by the function. Sum x equals to sum pi minus x is thus an MR that plays an oracle that plays a role of test oracle to help bug detection. MT has been successfully adopted to machine learning classifiers, Google Map app, and so on. For example, for autonomous driving systems, MRs can be defined as change of road seams does not significantly impact the driving decisions. However, as a typical AI-based app, there is a lack of approaches focusing on leveraging MRs based on different context conditions to test plant identification apps. Plant identification apps allow users to identify diverse plants simply by photographing them or uploading images with users' smartphones. It provides several possible identification results for the uploaded images instantly. Some apps also output the possible results with corresponding probabilities. Therefore, we propose a novel metamorphic testing approach, namely test plant ID, to automatically test plant identification apps. As is mentioned before, the key element of MT is set of MRs. So what is our MR? Here we give the answer. MRs can be designed as, no matter how contests are changed, the results are expected to be consistent with those under the corresponding original contest conditions. 
First, test plan ID defines a set of test contexts to depict the contextual factors of plant identification usage scenarios. Next, based on the test contexts, MRs are generated to support the test oracle checking. Then, by applying image transformations and photographing real-world plants, test plant ID generates follow-up images. The final step is to execute the test for detecting inconsistent behaviors. Different AI applications have diverse test contexts. For example, autonomous driving systems require testing under different weather context conditions like sunny, rainy, or snowy. HomeKit's voice command requires testing under different language and accent context conditions. A test context refers to a major factor or characteristic of an environmental condition. To construct a set of test contests for the plant identification app, two participants are involved in this process. Inspired by the MRs proposed by other MT studies, participants finally define seven test contests for plant identification. The table in this slide shows the test contests and their definitions. Then, we generate MRs for test oracle checking. MRs are generated based on the test contests, formerly for a plant identification app. Given original image X, test plan ID defines test context transformations T that change the context conditions of usage scenarios. Let Paul X be a follow-up image, which is generated by applying a transformation. Plant ID X is the top key result of the image X. Plant ID tall X is the top key result of the follow-up image. MRs can be designed as this. And in this case, one MR is defined that plant ID X and plant ID tall X should be identical when test context T is changed. If plant ID X and plant ID tall X are of significant difference, the app has strongly behaved. It means that if the results violate the corresponding MR, the app, the app has an inconsistent behavior under the specific test context. MT verifies the original and follow-up test cases, as well as their outputs against the corresponding MR. Test plant ID uses plant images as test inputs. By applying image transformations on original images and photographing real-world plants, we generate follow-up images to simulate various test contests. We use Python library OpenCV to implement the brightness, cropping, translation, rotation, and blur image transformations. Here are some examples of our generated follow-up images by applying simple image transformations. For MR background, Python library remove BG is leveraged for removing the background of the original image and keep the plant object. Then, we photographed six different images, which are used as new background images. The plant object is inserted into these six background images. Here shows two follow-up images after transforming the background. For MR angle, one participant was involved in photographing plants from different angles. We used the degree of the angle from the smartphone plane to the plant to define the different angles. Here shows three images with different angles. More information about the image transformations and the corresponding parameters can be seen in our paper. We perform a case study to investigate the effectiveness of test plant ID. We use, we use the dataset from the iNaturalist 2018 competition, which is a part of CVPR. We randomly selected 200 plant images as original images. By applying image transformations on original images and photographing real-world plants, a total of 8,400 plant images are used as test inputs. Three plant identification apps from Google Play Store are selected as subjects. 
to evaluate whether different MRs could trigger inconsistent behaviors. We select top 1 and top 3 results of each test image. For top 1 results, we compute the number of inconsistent behaviors under all MRs. For top 3 results, we compute the dissimilarity between the original results and follow-up results. The dissimilarity is computed by using a G-card index value. Effective MRs are the MRs with a higher chance of revealing failures. First, we check whether MRs based on test contests could review inconsistent behaviors of the top one results between the original and follow-up images. The table presents a number of inconsistent behavior of top one results across three apps under different MRs. From the table, we can observe that a total of 5,953 inconsistent behaviors are found across three apps. The number of inconsistent behavior of picture six is the lowest under all MRs. Plant snap shows the most robustness across three apps since it has a maximum number of inconsistent behaviors. Interestingly, some apps are more prone to inconsistent behaviors for some specific MRs than others. For example, PlantNet produces 325 inconsistent behaviors under MR distance, while the other two apps produce half of that number. Similarly, we detect 668 inconsistent behaviors of PlantNet with MR background, but only 490 and 159 for PlantNet and PictureDis, respectively. To evaluate whether different MRs could trigger inconsistency of top three results, we compute the dissimilarity of top three results. The ID value is computed for each pair of test inputs. These figures show the ID distribution under different MRs for three apps, respectively. In these figures, the mean ID value is depicted with a triangle label, and the median ID value is depicted with a solid line. We can observe that picture this performs more consistent than the other two apps under almost all MRs, with relatively lower median RD values and mean RD values. MR lightning, MR rotation, and MR distance have the relatively lower capability of revealing inconsistent behaviors on picture this. These MRs all have relatively lower median RD values equal to zero and mean RD values around 0 0.2. However, MR, MR angle has a high capability of detecting inconsistent behaviors on plant snap and plant net with median RD values up to 0 0.8 and 0 0.5 respectively. Compared with plant snap and picture this, MR distance shows effectiveness in detecting inconsistent behaviors on plant net with a mean with a median RD value and a mean RD value or close to 0.4. More analysis of the results can be seen in our paper. To sum up, different MRs based on test contests not only effectively detect inconsistent behaviors of plant identification apps, but also potentially be useful for the measurement of the robustness of different AI-based apps under diverse contest conditions. To make a conclusion, we propose an validated test plant ID, a metamorphic testing approach to test AI-based plant identification apps under different test contexts. To evaluate the robustness of plant identification apps, we leverage MRs based on test contexts to detect inconsistent behaviors by applying image transformations and photographing real-world plants. Follow-up images are generated for performing MT. Furthermore, a case study on three apps is performed to indicate the effectiveness of our approach. For future work, we will evaluate test plant ID on more plant identification apps. 
a large-scale empirical study with more data sets will be conducted. Meanwhile, we plan to implement an automatic testing tool for detecting inconsistent behaviors. As the image processing techniques, such as generative adversary network, become more and more advanced, we do expect that the generated images could be more close to real usage scenarios. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation titled Bully Alert, a mobile application for adaptive cyberbullying detection. I am Rahadim Rafiq and I will be delivering this presentation. First, let's talk about what motivated us to pursue this research direction in the first place. In recent years, there has been an exponential growth of online social networks. Unfortunately, this exponential growth has also led the way for a lot of cyberbullying instances to take place. Cyberbullying is very different from real-life bullying because it can be persistent and the perpetrators have access to the internet 24-7. So cyberbullying goes beyond the school year and the perpetrators have a way to victimize its victims in a 24-7 basis. Cyberbullying is also very different from cyber aggression in the sense that there has to be an imbalance of power between the victims and the perpetrators where the victims cannot easily defend himself or herself from a host of perpetrators. There has to be a repetition of aggression as well. If somebody comes to someone's profile and says something bad and goes away, that is cyber aggression. But here, because the perpetrators are constant, consistently uh, victimizing the victims, that's when a cyber aggression morphs into a cyber bullying instance. Cyberbullying has huge implications. Several suicides, as has been reported by the slides in the citations here, has been attributed to the cause of cyberbullying in recent years. Recent researchers uh, have made a huge amount of progress when it comes to developing accurate classifiers for cyberbullying. For example, several classifiers have been reported for many social networks such as Twitter, Instagram, and so on and so forth. Researchers have also focused on investigating system challenges such as uh, responsiveness and scalability of a potential cyberbullying detection system. However, two key issues that a cyberbullying detection system faces have been largely unexplored so far. The first issue, even if a cyberbullying detection system, no matter how scalable and responsive it is, it still has to accommodate a lot of social networks and a huge, huge number of users. So it's still a lot of computational, a lot of computational resources that is needed to accommodate such a system. And second, it is very counterintuitive to build one single classifier for all the people in the world because we believe that cyberbullying is very subjective. What might be cyberbullying for person A might not constitute cyberbullying for person B. So it can be very counterintuitive to build one single potential cyberbullying detection system classifier for everyone. So this is where we try to tackle these problems, these challenges in this research contribution. We first propose a design and implementation of an Android application. We call this Bully Alert. We talk about the adaptive cyberbullying detection that we have implemented through this application. This application is currently only available for Instagram. And after developing this application, we made it public so that people can use it. And then we collect data from those user downloads and usage. And then we performed a comparison of social network activity between two sets of users. Who are those two sets of users? The users who were being monitored through our app, we call them bully alert users. And the general set of Instagram users, we used an Instagram data set. Uh, we used an Instagram data set from a previous research and then made a comparison between the two sets of users in terms of like how much activity is going on between these two sets of users. Let's talk about the system design and implementation of Bully Alert. There are two components of this segment. First, we'll be talking about the use cases. What are the use cases that we try to cover through our application? And what is the architecture and implementation of the Bully Alert? There are two major components. Uh, 
uh, of our application. We call them the bully alert server, the adaptive classifier, and the polling mechanism. Let's go over the use cases first. There are three use cases, as you can see from the screenshots in this slide. In the first screenshot, this is a registration process where the user has to download, we will say the guardian, the guardian has to download the application, provide that email address, password, and some demographic information if they choose to do so. After the registration process is successful, the guardian will then be able to log into our app using their email and password through which they provided, which they provided when the registration was happening. The guardian will then be able to search for a particular user on Instagram through this uh, user search use case. The guardian will type in the username and then click the search and then the particular username and the user profile will come up. And then the guardian will have the option to select that user and start monitoring that user's activity. The guardian will also have the option to get the notification for that particular user. So whenever a perceived cyberbullying takes place on that user's profile, the application will send the guardian a notification tile the tile will have the username for which a notification was raised, the social network name for which the uh, notification was raised, and this high means the level, so the severity level of the notification. It can be high or low. The guardian will then have the option to actually click on each tile and go to a detailed page where the guardian will be able to see all the comments and all the usernames associated with those comments for which this notification was raised. And upon seeing all the notification details, the whole comment thread, the guardian will have the option to say, okay, this notification was right or this notification is wrong. We call this a feedback. We'll see how we will, how we will be using this feedback in the later slides. So this is the general architecture of the bully alert application. Here is a guardian. The guardian talks to the bully alert application. The bully alert application talks to the bully alert server for data collection and user authentication in terms of login and registration processes. The bully alert application's poly mechanism is responsible for talking to the Instagram server to collect the social network activity for all the users that are being monitored by the guardian. So after getting the data and getting the notification and serving the notification to the guardian, the guardian will then be able to give feedback for each notification and those feedbacks are then fed to the bully alert applications classifier. Let's talk in details about what are these components and how are they used and how are they implemented. First, bully alert server. Bully alert server is responsible as you have seen in the previous slides is for registration and login verification purposes. Bully alert server is also responsible for storing the notification of the guardians. So every time a notification comes in through the guardian, it has a list of comments for which the notification was raised, the user's information for which the notification was raised, and the severity level, high or low of the notification. All this information are stored in the bully alert server. This server is also responsible for storing feedbacks as well. What I mean by feedback is that Every time the guardian gets a notification, he or she will be able to see the comment thread for which notification was raised and then he or she will give a feedback, okay, this notification was right or this notification was wrong. So we store this information. We store the actual application notification which was high or low, the severity level and the comment thread. We call this whole packet, this whole packet, the feedback information and we store this feedback information in the bully alert server as well. We also store the classifier information for each guardian. What I mean by that, that every time the guardian gives a feedback, this feedback is then used to update the classifier for each parent's, each guardian's individual classifier in the application. And then we store this information, this classifier information in the bully alert server. Why do we do that? Is This is because if a guardian uninstalls our application and stops using our application and then reinstalls our application three months later, we want that guardian to be able to start right where from he or she left off. So we used MongoDB for storing the data for the application. We used RESTful API uh, for internal communication between the components and we use Node.js for the implementation of the server. 
Let's talk about the second component that is the adaptive classifier. This is the this is the component, this is the classifier that accommodates the subjectiveness of cyberbullying. We hypothesize that each parent's individual tolerance level is a variable that is dependent on many factors. We it may depend on race, it may depend on age, gender, and so on and so forth. So the idea is the way this component works is that upon receiving a notification, the guardian can give feedbacks as you have seen from the use cases. So upon seeing the comment thread, the guardian thinks the notification was right or wrong, he or she will be able to give the feedback and then this feedback and then this feedback is then fed to the resident classifier. What is that resident classifier? We use the logistic regression classifier that is reported from the paper that is cited at the bottom of this slide. This resident classifier is then takes this feedback and then treats this new feedback as a new training example. What I mean by that, it has this comment thread that is a list of comments and then the guardian's feedback, the right or wrong. That particular thing, that particular feedback and then is then used as a new training example for the logistic regression classifier. Then we take the feedback data, this is processed to get or extract the feature values for the classifier and then we use stochastic gradient descent on this feedback data to get a new updated classifier for each parent's individual system. Each guardian resident classifier is thus updated according to their individual tolerance level based on their individual feedbacks. So a very natural question that comes after all of this is that what do we do for the parents who are not giving any feedback at all? And the way we try to tackle this issue is the following. What we do is that we have in our bully alert server a single general classifier that is used by every guardian when they download our application the very first time. So we call this the general classifier. So what we do is that we collect all the feedbacks from all the guardians and we store them in our bully alert server. And then we store our, these stored feedbacks from all the guardians. We use all these feedbacks to update that general classifier. So we call this the updated general classifier. And this is the classifier that we then propagate to all the guardians who are not giving any feedbacks. And this is how we tackle this particular issue. The code is available in this link. The last component of our application is called the polling mechanism. The polling mechanism is responsible for the following. The polling mechanism helps or enables the guardians to search for a user. So you see, you saw the user search use case where the guardian can type in a username and a profile will show up. So this information is coming from the polling mechanism. The polling mechanism is also responsible to poll a user profile every hour for a new media sessions. When I say media session, media session is meaning it's an image and the associated comments posted by the user. So every time a guardian, so all the guardians who are monitoring all the users, this polling mechanism is responsible for polling all those user profiles every hour to see if any new media sessions has been posted for the monitoring profiles. It also pulls all the media sessions for those monitored users to see any new collection of comment that has come in to the threads. If a new comment comes in, the polling mechanism takes in the new comment thread, feeds the new data, feeds the new data to the adaptive classifier and classifies it and gives a new notification to the parent if something happens or not. Now we do a preliminary user data analysis based on the data that we have collected through our application. So for this, we use two sets of data. We use the data that we collected from our application. What I mean by that is that these are the set of users who were being monitored by the guardians who have downloaded our application. We call them the bully alert users. So the second set of users that we use are the general Instagram users from the papers cited at the bottom of this slide. These are the users in the general set of users who are not being monitored by these are the general Instagram users. So we, what we wanted to see is that if there's any difference of social network activity, such as getting likes, getting comments, uh, posting media sessions and so on and so forth. If there's any difference between the general Instagram users and the 
users who are being monitored through our Boolean identification. So this is a graph that shows the CCDF, cumulative complementary uh, distribution function of number of likes and number of comments for those two sets of users, the Boolean alert users and the general users. If you see the dots that are for Boolean alert users, you can see if you, if you look at the uh, likes CCDF, that is the left side of the slide, you can see that only maybe 18% of the total Boolean alert users get more than 1000 likes, whereas almost 65% of the general users get more than 1000 likes. So what, what it means is that a lot of users, so what it means is that the bully alert users get a lot of less likes when compared to the general users. This same pattern is also very uh, present in, when it comes to comments as well. As you can see, if you look at this graph, uh, only maybe 17 or 16% of the bully alert users get more than 100 comments whereas almost maybe like 35 percent of the general users get more than 100 comments when it comes to general instagram users so the bully alert users are far less active when it comes to getting likes and getting the number of comments this particular pattern is also present when it comes to the number of media that are being shared as well. As you can see, only 10% or 5% of the users in Bully Alert share more than 500 posts, whereas almost 80%, more than 80% of the general users share more than 500 posts. So this comparison shows that the Bully Alert users, the users who are being monitored through our app are far less active when it comes to getting likes, getting a number of comments and sharing medias. We claim that applications classifier that we use will thus have far less data to process and make classification decisions, which means that our classifier does not have to be as lightweight as reported in the paper that you said at the bottom where they were building a potential centralized cyberbullying detection system and they had to utilize a classifier that is very lightweight, very fast. But because we are dealing with a very less amount of data in our application, so that means we can move away from using a lightweight classifier in our Boolean alert application. So in, in conclusion, we make the following contributions. We have outlined a motivation and design for a mobile application for cyberbullying detection. We have presented the design and architecture of Boolean alert and then we provided a preliminary user analysis of the monitored user's data in this presentation. And this concludes my presentation. Thanks. And if you have any questions and answers, you can email me at rahat.rafiq at colorado.edu. Thank you so much. Good morning. Today I will report the paper called Optimization of Memory Usage, an Android Low Memory Management Mechanism. My name is Hong Jiefan from Peking University, Beijing, China. Our reports including the uh, following abstract introduction, platform architecture and the methodology. Experimental Results Summary When users manipulate low memory Android devices, they frequently count the application problem of loading slowly because of limit, limited amount of memory. In particular, more application installed problem will occur more frequently. We deeply observed the low memory mechanism of Android system and find the system has some shortcomings such as memory recovery efficiency, unnecessary memory requests. In this paper, we optimize memory usage of by improving recovery efficiency, prioritize the use of less memory, 
prevent the instantaneous increase in memory usage and reduce unnecessary memory requests. Experimental, re experimental results in a real experiment the real environments show that our method effectively increases the size of free memory and reduces the phenomena of application self-startup and association startup. Andrew is a Linux-based open source operating system which runs on smartphones, tablets, smart TVs, and wearable devices, and so on. Compared to other embedded systems, Android system has a good op, uh, open source features. Programs can quickly develop application without compromising application com compatibility. And the IT vendors can easily provide future-specific devices to meet diverse and complex needs. However, as the number of loading applications increases, the memory requires makes, make it impossible for running some applications smoothly on low memory devices. It is it causes users to load the system slowly, especially when more applications installed, the user experience experience will be affected under this situation. This phenomenon mainly, mainly due to the lack of system memory by two reasons. The first one is Android is a multitask system based on Linux system. The com Corresponding applications is executed according to the priority and the queen order. Under the situation of low system memory and a high CPU load, tasks such as user opera operations are to be queen for execution and the system is unresponsible. In order to reclaim the portion of the memory, the system has to clean up most of the file crash and uh, even terminate some of the application process. When these applications are used again, the system needs to reallocate the memory and load the file resources, which result in a large time expenditure. We optimize the instantaneous increase of memory usage and uh, reduce the unnecessary memory application. In summary, the contribution in this paper are follows are uh, as follows. The first one, we modify the Linux, uh, Linux kernel layer to improve the recovery uh, efficiency by LMK. The second one is we modify the active, active, ac activity man uh, manager service part of application framework layer to uh, preferentially recycle less memory. The third one is modify the active service in the application uh, framework layer to prevent the instantaneous uh, growth of memory usage. The last one is uh, modify the application layer to reduce unnecessary memory requests. Now we will report the platform architecture and the methodology. As shown in this figure, First, we use VM pressure to calculate the memory recovery pressure of the current system by ratio of scanned page size and the recovered page size. According to the VM pressure, we estimate current memory recovery pressure. We terminate a qualifying pre uh, process and reclaim memory if the system is in low memory. In addition, we provide the priority to recover less used memory called activity management uh, manager service. The system uploads the sum values of the process according to the importance. Additionally, we reduce the memory usage rate by increasing the maximum number of uh, concurrent starts of the service to alleviate the pressure of memory recovery and give the CPU enough time to recycle. Besides, we reduce unnecessary memory requests from the perspective of restricting application uh, self-setting up, set up and uh, association setup. The first step, we improve the memory recovery efficiency. In order to improve the me uh, memory recovery efficiency of LMK, we introduce the VM pressure 
a formula to me uh, measure the memory recovery pressure of the current system. The main idea of the VM pressure uh, formula is to use the ratio of unnecessary reclaimed memory size to the scan page size as a measure of system memory recovery pressure. So when the recovery pressure is large, the system is terminated. It is worth mentioning that initial instantaneous pressure index, index is not very accurate, but over time, the ratio will gradually be averaged and refined to accurately to represent the memory recovery pressure of the current system. When the pressure is large, the system will terminate the pressure with small value and uh, improve the efficiency of uh, memory recovery. The second step is we prioritize the use of less memory. In order to prevent the use of uh, the useless process for, from being reclaimed due to the fi failure to reach the pre uh, preset low memory threshold, we present we prevent the system from being uh, in a low memory state by professionally recycling a uh, few processes. The main idea of this method is according to a large number of test verification. We find the service process working in the background and select least recurrently, uh, recently used uh, process according to the order in the LUR. The third step is to prevent the instantaneous increase. When the number of uh, concurrent services in the service is large, the instantaneous memory use, usage will increase, causing a sudden shortage of memory space in system. In this situation, we reduce the memory usage rate by increasing the maximum number of uh, concurrent st starts of the service to alleviate the pressure of memory recovery and give the CPU enough time to recycle. The fourth is to reduce unnecessary memory request. It is necessary to reduce unnecessary memory request from the perspective of restricting application self-starting and associated startup the system sends two nodes broadcasting and the start service to opti optimize. We conduct two devices, T-original device and the T-optimal device, and we run different apps on a uh, mobile device with internet core 2 gigabyte memory for pro uh, performance test and uh, uh, result verification. Here is the detailed uh, configuration parameters of uh, Yoga Flat 3. After powering on, let it stand for 10 minutes. Then we check the current memory status of the system and the record the value of memory available. Then open the uh, app list and tap the uh, apps icon. After system delay, the application interface records the value of memory available. Then press the home button to recover, uh, return to the desktop. According to the application list, we cycle step two and step three, and use the memory available after the first of. Uh, 15 applications to compare the results of two devices before and after optimization. So, we compare the data of two devices before and after optimization to test whether the solution can optimize system performance and optimization in three ways. Calculate the, the state of device free memory, filter analysis and statistics intercepts counts the interface response speed. As shown in this figure, it is a comparison of uh, average free memory. The memory of T-original of power-on set is 
363 megabytes after 10 minutes, which is slightly higher than the operating threshold of 315 memory for LMK. After use, using two applications and the free memory is lower than LMK's working threshold, as the number of applications increases, the memory resources are in short supply, and the minimum is uh, 67 megabytes, which may cause crash in the system process. The T-optimized average free memory is 385 megabytes, and the lowest memory is 270 megabytes. It is still worth it. It is still in the uh, primary threshold range of the LMK. At this time, the memory recovery pressure is not very is not too large. So here is the comparison of free memory before and after optimization. It is clearly seen that the memory usage of the system by setting the select memory page after the device is turned and uh, uh, after stand to for 20, 24 hours. By monitoring this free memory, uh, free memory test weather can uh, improve the memory recovery efficiency. We observe observe this device before and uh, before optimization for ten minutes and after uh, after it can have uh, has the a significant uh, uh, comparison. Here is the validation for free memory during booster. Uh, process. We observe the uh, device before optimization for 10 minutes and uh, after the boost is still low, uh, 363 megabytes, slightly higher than LMK operating threshold of 315 megabytes after two uh, after use two applications. The free memory is lower than the working threshold of LMK as the number of applications used increase. The memory resources are in short supply, and the maximum uh, minimum is is 73, 70, 67 megabytes, which causes the system to restart. The optimized device has an average uh, memory of 385 megabytes and minimum memory of 270 megabytes, which is still in the primary threshold of LMK. And this is the time comparison of T optimized, uh, T original and the T optimized. For ease of uh, for ease of uh, observation, it can be found from from the test result that before optimization, uh, as T original device, respond for a long time, especially in the case of seven application after setup, the dis display interface takes two uh, to. Four minutes, and even the application does not respond, such as Weibo or system crash, uh, not easy music, and other serious problem. The optimized device, uh, shown as T optimized device, has an average response time of 1.2 seconds. The response time of only two applications is long, around three to four seconds, and no application is. Unresponsive, unresponsive or system crash. By increasing size of free memory and reducing the application self startup and associating startup, the system can effectively shorten the response time of uh, user. In addition, it is also found that limiting the uh, application self start starting or self uh, associating startup significantly reduces the number of broadcast and service. Here we give our conclusion. We all know mobile applications usually can only access limited amounts of memory, especially in low memory situation. In this paper, we analyze the principle of LMK mechanism and point out the reason for the low recovery efficiency and error recovery process of LMK. After that, 
We propose the optimization scheme for avoiding the low memory state. Experimental results show that our method effectively increases the size of free memory, reduces the phenomenon of application self-setup and association setup. In the future, we plan to further extend our uh, approach suitable for more applications. Besides, we will consider the new combined method or crashing strategies to optimize the memory usage. Our work is supported by the National uh, Natural Science Foundation of China. OK, here is my report. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The name of our work is Design of a Security Service Orchestration Framework for NFV. This work was conducted by Songhu, Wu Qianjun, Chen Yuhang, and Dong Meiya. They are from State Grid Jiangsu Electric Power Company Limited, Information and Communication Branch. Information System Integration Company, Nari Great Corporation, Taiyuan University of Technology. The network functions virtualization emerges as a promising network architecture that separates network functions from proprietary devices. NFV lowers the cost of hardware components and enables fast and flexible deployment of network devices, services. Despite these advantages, NFV introduces new security challenges. Currently, there is little research on a holistic framework to solve those security issues. In this paper, we propose a security service orchestration framework that can construct a cooperate, cooperative working mechanism for NFV security. We present the demand analysis and describe the system design principles and implementation details. We propose a lightweight, holistic architecture design of a secure service orchestration system to solve current security issues. The system's effectiveness is also shown by beyond technical reviews. As shown in the figure, an NFV architect consists of an NFV infrastructure we call it NFVI, Network Functions Virtualization Infrastructure. Virtualized Network Functions, NVF, and Management and Network Orchestration, we call it MALO. The NFVI is built on the basis of non-proprietary hardware like X6086 servers and VNFs are virtualization of network functions. They are deployed and running on virtual machines. MALO are composed of virtualized infrastructure manager, VIM, VNM manager, and MVF orchestration. In this paper, we also propose a security orchestration as part of framework. It can both connect this function and make real-time security assessment on the process of data flow of whole NFV system. The design of a security orchestration system for NFV should include the following components. Web business layer, 
The front end display of a filtration system is the entrance to the interactive between the orchestration system and the user, and it's also the generator of the orchestration security strategy. The application deployment standards in the orchestration system, security devices of different manufacturers are, ac are accessed through a proxy app, the agent app, Northbound interacts with the orchestration engine by following the standard, while the southbound converts the standard into device in interface data to achieve the adaption of devices to the orchestration system. Orchestration strategy means the orchestration system needs to provide a set of description specification of the orchestration logic which is convenient to transform the orchestration scenario into a program perceivable orchestration strategy. Except for those components we design security service curography system architecture. Based on the previous analysis of requirements for security service, we divide the orchestration system into four major parts for design and deployment, namely the web business layer, the orchestration engine, the relevant modules within the security controller and the virtual security service device management platform. The top layer of architecture is web business layer deployed based on the App Store platform, which is generally deployed on a central server to provide users with web interaction services and generate orchestration strategies. So following, we are going to talk about our system workflow so that we can, in this part, we're going to talk about the system workflow. Firstly, AppStone recommends related security orchestration scenarios to users based on their asset information. After the user selects and customized the orchestration method of a security service, the App Store sends the corresponding orchestration strategy to the orchestration engine. Then, the orchestration engine analyzes the orchestration strategy and the generate is a job for it. Finally, the engine executes according to the scaling method specified by the policy. The orchestration strategy supports flexible job execution methods, such as executing once every five minutes, keeping the task all the time, or stopping the task after executing it several times. The following details we're going to talk about is how the job execution uh, proceeds. In the beginning, the engine calls the first application of orchestration scenes according to the strategy. Then, if the service requires the device to implement, the application sends a device call request to the controller. Thirdly, the security controller selects the probable, appropriate security equipment through the resource scaling algorithm. Then, security controller collects the execution results. Finally, the engine compares the returned information by the application with the orchestration strategy.
in following, we design the app, app store layer and the data center networking hierarchy model. With the introduction of NFV, the physical resources at the infrastructure layer are pulled into virtual resources to provide software functions for the business layer. A data center based on NFV architecture should have sufficient band bandwidth resources and the various network facilities in order to ensure the normality, normality of virtual network elements in operation. The internal management mechanisms seem particularly relevant. The design hierarchy model of the data center network is shown in the figure. The virtual security management platform. Then we move to data center network hierarchy code model. With introduction of NFV, the physical resources at the infrastructure layer are pulled into virtual resources to provide software functions for the business layer. A data center based on the NFV architecture should have sufficient bandwidth resources. In this way, a various network facilities in order to ensure the normality of virtual network elements in operation. The internal management mechanism seems particularly relevant. The data centers should ensure the flexible division of network arrows. They are constructing an NFV-based data center that meets the data center design versus uh, principles. Different application systems can be divided into different arrows. This must be a cool layer that is responsible for course weighting functions. It is the core part of the entire network that acts a transmission bus. Compared with in other levels, the features of the system are enhanced by directly adding equipment at the core switching layer to improve scalability and availability. At the same time, the access device must be collected to the network access layer to compete complete the function of the device accessing the network. An aggregation layer is added between network access layer and a cool layer to complete complete the aggregation function of access device. Finally, ex externally access resources to increase network exit layer and at the same time the net add network firewall load balance uh, balancing and other equipment to data center inside and outside. This layered design can not only ensure security of each region, increase flexibility, but also have good scalability. We design is written in Python and combines open source technologies such as DNS, uh, Libvirt, OpenSmith, OpenV Smith and the Linux Lame space. In this section, we explain the solution of the system from the perspective of device stub, a device stub and registra registration, device network management, and data database selection. Firstly, the device, uh, the device stub and registration, registration in the software design security architect. Secondly, we explain the equipment network management, which is shown in figure. Including NFV is considered a fundamental of modern networking. It can support various applications such as Internet of Things, 
and mo mobile computing, based on software-defined security architects and NFA technology. This paper designs and implements a security system, a security service enhancement system. The innovation lies in building a bridge between security service, changing the de delivery model of cloud security services and transforming from a delivery of a single security service to a delivery of multiple security services in a co co uh, coordinated security protection scheme. The change of the delivery mode not only endures the threshold for using security services and impro improves the user experiences, but also enhances the security protection efficiency and resource utilization of the cloud platform and reduces the cost of the cloud computing vendors. The orchestration system in this article is deeply integrated with software design, defined security technology, maximizing the advantage of software defined security technology, scaling the differences between various security vendors devices in the data plane and awakening the interest, intricate technical details of the underlying system with which the orchestra engine can focus on proceeding of high-level orchestration logic. And last, this research is sponsored by science and technology project of the state grade state grid Jiangsu Electric Power Car Operated Limited. J2019-123 NSFC project number 61772358 and NSFC project number 91572347. Thank you. The name of our work is an edge assist video computing framework for industrial in IoT. The authors are Zen Zen, Jin Yu Ze, Mao Miao Wei Wei, Wang Chuanjun, Li Shihao, Zhou Peng, Zhou Hongli, Dong Mei Ya. With the rapid development of industrial demands, the IoT triggers enormous interest of industry and academia interest. By employing IoT technologies, a large number of problems in the industry can be solved by intelligent sensing, wireless communication, and smart software analysis. However, in applying industrial IoT to improve real-time and immerse user experiences, we found that compared to traditional application scenarios such as tourism or daily experiences, industrial IoT applications face challenges in scalability Real as real time reaction and immerse user experiences. In this paper, we propose an edge assist framework that fits in industrial IoT to solve this fatal problem. We design a multipass algorithm that can successfully provide a real sense of immersion without changing the single frame image visual effect in terms of increasing rendering frame rate 
from experimental evaluation, it shows our design as a assistant rental framework can apply to multiple scenarios in industrial IoT system. In our research, we have explored our, a lot of international and domestic uh, domestic researches. For example, how to ex improve user experiences of industrial information system from 1980s for a random technology was proposed and we compose our system design as, the, as shown in the figure. The Fourier random model is mainly composed of three parts. The first is the dis discretization of the sampling rate distribution. The target sampling rate of each point on screen is determined based on the coordinates provided by eye tracking and distribution of high accuracy. Partitioning and decreation to provide a basis for sampling rate for multiple resolution rendering. After obtaining the sampling rate distribution, the second sub module of for a random multiple resolution rendering module perform multiple resolution randomly on the screen according to the sample rate and multi-pass implements multi-resolution randomly. The second sub-module is to call random engine to execute a multi-resolution rendering solution and render the output, the image to the screen of virtual reality hamlet according to the information of the 3D scenes. This paper many introduce in implementation and improvement scheme of the forum randomly algorithm. Thus, we firstly carried out this discretization of sampling rate distribution according to the idea of a sample rate discretization. This paper adopts a three-layer sample rate distribution decretization and the lasting and super superposition scheme to achieve the can keep center randomly as shown as shown in figure since each layer is rendered by uh, by same resolution sensitivity of the human eye is gradually reduced from center to the periphery the resolution of each layer must meet the highest resolution requirements of human heart, human eye. People feel a significant change in resolution. The oblique line in figure 2 represents the distribution of the minimum res resolving angle MAR of human eye along with the eccentric angle. The relationship between sampling rate and the minimum definition view angle is shown in above figure. The sampling rate calculation model. It is assumed that refraction of eyepiece magnifies the screen distance by five times. E is the eccentric angle. Omega. Is minimum resolution angle mark at E and RE represent the, ramp, the sample rate at E. D is the actual distance of human eye from the screen and D is the distance between the human eye and the screen after being refracted by the eyepiece. The formula of the formula for calculating the sample rate is derived as the formula one for therefore 
therefore the minimum wheeling angle MAR is more so our small angle trigo trigonometry function approximation formula can be used. The formula 1 can be simplified to formula 2. In summary, if E1 and E2 are selected as a dividing line of an eccentric angle, the sampling rate calculation formula of the three regions is formula 3. And implementation of multiple layer channel overlay. In this paper, we introduced implementation of multipass with multiple channel resolution rendering. Multipass divides the screen into several concentric square layers according to eccentric angle radius E from the center of human eye, each square arrow is rendered at a gradually lower sampling rate from inside to the outside and then multiple layered and nested to form a Fourier randomly image. This paper from the table we can see in this, in order to implement the three layered multipass algorithm, three cameras were used as a set of renderers in the experiment. Then, control camera parameters to achieve different resolution levels of rendering C2, C1 to C3 in order to form high definition to low definition rendering. And the parameter list is shown in multiple camera parameters in table 1. In following, we present our algorithm descri description when the eye, when the human eye rotates the two cameras in the middle, also rotate according so visual center arrow is rendered in C1. The Transition arrow is rendered in C2, and the edge arrow, the multiple counter algorithm, rendered by C3, no resolution. So we describe all the algorithm in the following codes, and we present the formula four, five, six, seven to form our multiple multipath algorithm. From uh, after implementation, multiple pass algorithm in a layered and elastic manner, we analyze the performance and verifies its effects, and lays the foundation for improvement of multiple pass in the following. In uh, in our work, we also we also may uh, design our experimental uh, evaluation and verification. Uh, the multipass and model resolution rendering algorithm, algorithm multipass is implemented based on existing hardware and rendering pipeline so it can directly compare and render frame rate with 4 pixel rendering that doesn't use for Fourier rendering, therefore representing the improvement in algorithm speed of foreign rendering through the comparison of shaded pixels, pixels and rendering effects. The improvement over multipass is explained. In order to test all uh, about algorithm, the virtual reality scenes selected in the experiment include three as shown above, you can see a uh, game sense with more complex textures and models, a classroom scene with a simple model, a scene containing two the museum scene, uh, scene of a layered definition model is used to test the effect of multiple multi multi algorithm. The foreign 
our evaluation is divided into two parts. The first part is the four Fourier rendering module eva evaluation. The second part is called uh, the multipass algorithm uh, evaluation. So, uh, from our following, we we use the comparison of sampling rates between multipass and the full randoming and the comparison between the frame rate of three virtual reality scenes with multipass following uh, rendering and full randomly we can see uh, we can draw a conclusion uh, that in this paper uh, we can draw a conclusion that uh, our uh, algorithm is effectively improve the performance uh, performance of rendering to improve the industrial IoT uh, scenarios and user experiences. Uh, in concluding, in this paper, we started a significant framework to improve user experiences in industrial IoT systems, we design a new for rendering technology to accelerate the rendering rate to avoid motion sickness in industry. Given the characteristics of industrial IoT equipment, high refresh rate requirements, large field of vision, vision and IP distortion. distortion we have conducted a full investigation, demonstration, and improvement of existing related technologies to adapt to the used scenarios of virtual reality equipment. We proposed an edge assist rendering framework to solve the problem. We improved, implemented a multi-pass and multi-resolution rendering algorithm called Multipass, which was based on a utility 3D development engine. In this paper, we evaluated its performance and randomly effect. From experimental evaluation, our framework can improve and increase the random rate by three to by two to three times without affecting the user visual experience. This result indicate that this research is an effective method to solve the existing problem in terms of user experiences improvement in industrial IoT system. Thank you. We, uh, we thank all the sponsors for this work. Thank you again. Hello everyone. First, uh, thank you everyone for watching my paper report. I'm Yingxin from Zhengzhou University. The title of my paper is Image Classification of Brain Tumors Using Improved CNN Framework with Data Augmentation. This paper introduced a brain tumor diagnosis framework for mobile medical devices, which include brain tumor segmentation, data augmentation, and using deep CNN to classify brain tumors. I will explain this paper in five parts. The first part is the background and the significance of this paper. At the present, the problem of medical treatment is getting more and more serious. The main problems of the traditional medical system is the contradiction between the growth of patients and the shortage of, of medical human resources. And the brain tumors are characterized by high harm and high mortality. The classification of the brain tumor is more com complicated. The three common brain tumors are glioma, meningioma, and 
respiratory tumor. Therefore, accurately diagnosing the tips of brain tumor is crucial for the treatment of this disease. Traditional uh, diagnostics method rely on experienced doctors to diagnose brain tumors for the patient through the medical imaging. The method mainly relies on doctors' knowledge and experience, and the diagnosis results of the different doctors may be different. Therefore, the efficiency of this method is low, and the diagnosis uh, accuracy is low. Mobile medical equipment can improve the above medical problems, and it can share the original information system of the hospital to improve the overall worker efficiency. For example, using a computer edit diagnosis system can assist doctors in diagnosing patients. The traditional computer edit diagnosis system mainly uses uh, machine learning, but the uh, classification accuracy is not high, and using uh, deep learning can improve the classification accuracy. The workflow of this paper is as follows. First, segment the ROI of the brain tumors, and then use two methods to augment the data samples after segmentation. The third step is to classify brain tumors. We improve the two classic deep learning models to classify glioma, meningioma, and the perturbatory tumor, respectively, and then compare the performance of the two models through a series of evaluation indicators. The second part is introduce the brain tumor. The second part introduce the brain tumor segmentation and the data augmentation. We use the fixed share data set for experiments. This data set is public. The fixed share data set contains 3064 brain MRI images of 233 patients. And the images belong to the MRI. It contains the 1,426 images of the glioma. Meningioma contains 708 images. And the pituitary contains 930 images. The resolution of the images is 512 by 100, 512. We use the threshold segmentation technique proposed by Axio to segment the ROI of the three types of the brain tumors. And the bandwidth images are generated from the original MRI grayscale images, and the white represents the tumor area. Training a deep learning model required a large number of data samples, and the original data set has a few samples, so we use the two methods for data augmentation, respectively. Image processing technique and the DCGN, each method then amplifies the data set by 32 times. The first data augmentation method is based on the image processing technique. The table shows that there are nine image processing techniques in total, each of which has different parameters with a total of 32 parameters, so a data sample can be enlarged to 32. The first five image processing technique mainly augment data samples through dramatic transformation, such as rotating images to different angles to generate new images. The last four methods are to add noise data samples to the data set. The purpose is to verify the robustness of the algorithm. The second method is based on DCGN, which can generate a new data samples. Its network structure is more stable than GN, and it can be keep the image size unchanged without losing information. So it can generate a high quality data samples. And shown in the figure, the left is a normal new sample, and the right is an abnormal data sample. When an abnormal uh, data sample is found, it will be manually deleted. After data augmentation, the simple sizes of the three brain tumors are as shown in the table. Then we propose the data samples. Since the input lines of the VGG19 network and the inception V3 network are different, 
And these two models are designed for RGB images. Our data samples are GraphQL images. So first, just the image size, then copy the channels three times to become three channels. In the third part, I will introduce the two ways to improve deep learning models. VGG Nineteen Networks consists of the nineteen various layers, in which there are sixteen convolutional and three four connected layers, as shown in figure. The improved network framework in this paper is seventeen various layers with fifteen convolutional layers and two fully connected layers. The specific improvements step are as follows. First, in the original VGG Nineteen Network. A convolutional layers with 64 channels is added after the second convolutional layer, and a convolutional layer with 128 channels is added after the fourth convolutional layer. The purpose is that because of the segmented ROI image is a binary grayscale image, the counter features of the tumor are very important. So, adding a convolutional layer near the input layer can better extract low-order features. Second, deleting the 11th, 12th, 15th, and 16th convolutional layers, which can space up model convergence. Third, deleting the last four connection layer and using a convolutional layer without output three as the new four connection layer. The size of the convolutional kernel is one by one, and in order to prevent and reduce overfitting, dropout optimization skills is added after two follow connected layers and the last one convolution layer. The second improved model is Inseparable Wave 3. The improvement of the improved Inseparable Wave 3 in this paper uses inductive transfer learning. The figure shows the principle of in inductive transfer learning in this paper. We use the data set in Imaginate to train the original Inseparable Wave 3 model and transform the learned knowledge to the classification model in this paper. The source data is the data set in Imaginate. The target data is the figure share data set. The source desk is a 1000 class classification, and the target desk is a 3 class classification of the brain tumors. The knowledge learned from the source data is the feature of the na nature imaging in the imaginate data set, such as the color feature and the shape feature in its simple. The improvement to in several ways in this paper are the four. First, Deleting the original fully connected layer of the inseparable with 3 network and reassert a new fair connected layer with an output size of 3 to adapt it to the target donate. Delay the lost function in the original classification layer and use the new loss function. Second, using the methods of the transfer learning and the low level features of the data in the imaginated data set. Uh, learned by the protruded layer from the original inside registry. Then, using the segmented and processed data samples of the figure tumor data set to the train the improvement inside registry model for the experiment. We set the learn factor for weights and the basis added the new uh, following connected layer to 10. The purpose is to make the model learning specific high level features of the target donate. The conclusion layer of the model is unchanged. Only the structure after the FC layer is changed. This figure shows the improved in several ways we model classification figure work. When training, the model learns classification based on the learned training features and the training levels. During the testing, the features of the test features are input into the class fair, and the model protects the test levels. Then calculated the classification accuracy of the test by actual test level. The first part introduces the experiment and the experiment result. First, introduce our experiment process. The first step is the select state the optimizer. We compare the performance of the SGD and the other optimizers and choose the other optimizer. Then, through the experiments, it's found that the Yada optimizer parameter eta and the parameter learning rate and the feature size of the model affects the performance of the model. So, first, we determined the value of the Adam parameter eta and then we set a different learning rate value and a different feature size values. We tried to improve models with the 
data set item, augmented it by DCGN separately, compare the accuracy of the models and analyze the impact of the learning rate and the bit size on the model accuracy and the loss. Secondly, we used the data set before and after the data augmentation to try the to improve the models. Then we compare the accuracy of the two improved models before and after augmentation and analyze the impact of the data augmentation on brain tumor classification. Finally, we'll compare the performance of the two models before and after data augmentation. This paper conducts five experiments and each participant follows them five cross evaluation at the patient level. The loss of the loss of function is the average value after five experiments. We use the classification precision recall specificity and accuracy to evaluate the classification performance of the models. The SGD algorithm has a slow convergence speed, so we switch to Yadon algorithm. In order to verify the performance of the Yadon optimizer, we try to improve the VGG19 model on the organized original dataset with the SGD optimizer and the Yadon optimizer respectively. The average loss function values of the first 10 epics are shown in figure. In the 10 epics, the training trade of the loss value of the SGD optimizer is not uh, otherwise. And the loss of value of the Adam optimizer drops rapidly at the third epic and uh, continue to decline thereafter. During the experiment, we found that the parameter eta of the Adam optimizer affects the convergence speed and um, accuracy of the two models. When the two models use the Yada optimizer with the original data set, we set different values. After 10 epics, compare the accuracy and the loss of the two models and show in table. According to the result in the table, we set each to 0 0.0001. Different learning rates and the beach size will serve as effect factor the accuracy and the loss of the model. During the experiment, train the model on the data set augmented by DCGM, set different parameters and different epics, and compare the accuracy and the loss of the two models as shown in the table, according to the result in the table. First, when the learning rate of the two models are 0 0.0001, and the bit size of the two models are 16.4, the accuracy of the two models are the highest and the loss of the loss of function are the smallest. Second, for the VGG19 model, when the bit size is 64, the learning rate is 0 0.0001 and the accuracy of the model defer graduate, indicating that the VGG19 model is more sensitive to the learning rate. Third, when the learning rate of two models is 0 0.0001 and the bit size is 4964 and 100 28 respectively. The difference in model accuracy rate is small, and the difference in lost ratio is large, indicating besides efforts in the direction of the gradual intensity. After determining the parameters, we can see the accuracy of the two models in the open data dataset. The data set augmented with DCG and the data set augmented with imaging processing technique, and show in the figure. According to the result, data augmentation is effective for training models and the accuracy of the two models using DCGA is higher than the accuracy of the two models using imaging processing techniques. Then we specifically analyze the performance of the two models according to other evaluation indicators. First, using the original data set and the DCGA enhanced data set to train the two models respectively and then calculate the precision, recall, and the specificity based on the confusion matrix of the two models as shown in the table. It is the experimental result of the improving the VGG19 model. According to the experimental result, we can see that before, after, before and after data augmentation, the accuracy of the model ha has increased by about 4.63%. This result indicates that data augmentation has a greater impact on the performance of the improved VGG19 model. And the specificity of the improved VGG19 model before and after data augmentation are relatively high, both of the which are more than 19%, which can judge the true negative patients 
and can be used for the positive diagnosis before and after data augmentation. The position of the model for uh, geoma in tiger. Well, the position of the main geoma and the pituitary tumor is lower, which means the cost uh, by imbalance of the data of the three brain tumors. The position and the recall of the main geoma are low, and the proportion of the main geoma misclassified is higher than other brain tumors. In the experiment, we compare the accuracy of the model before and after the improvement on the data set augmented using DCGN. The accuracy of the VGG19 model before improvement is 89.81%, and it increased to 91.73% after the improvement. According to the comparison result, the accuracy of the improved model increases, indicating that the improvement of the VGG19 model is effective on this data set. After improvement, the ability to learn features of the model becomes stronger. These two tables are the experimental results of the improved inception V3. According to the results, after the data augmentation, the performance of the improved inception V3 models has been significantly improved, indicating that using data augmentation can improve the performance of the classifier. But the precision and the specificity of the glioma are reduced after the data augmentation. The accuracy of the improved inception V3 before and after Data augmentation increased by 3.65%. Compared with the improved VGG19 models, the increase of the accuracy is relatively small. The accuracy and the specificity of the meningioma and the pituitary tumors were less than 19% before and after the data augmentation. Comparing the result of the VGG19 models, it can be seen that the data imbalance affects the CNN model to extreme features. The quality and the quantity of the data science series affect the classification performance of the model. The accuracy of the Inceptor V3 model before improvement is 86.79%, and it increased to 88.96% after the uh, improvement. According to the comparison result after the improvement, the accuracy of the model increased. This can indirectly ex explain the transfer learning is conducive to training a deeper network model. Compared with other methods using figure shared data set, according to the result in the table, our methods have higher classification accuracy, and the improved VGG19 model has the highest classification accuracy. Finally, we summarize our research. In this paper, we propose a three-class classification system for brain tumors based on data augmentation and the improved CN framework. Our system has a high accuracy and specificity, and the system can be applied to mobile medical equipment for the positive diagnosis. This classification system provides the possibility for migration to mobile medical equipment, and can improve the, the diagnostic performance of the mobile medical equipment. But this paper still needs several improvements. First, too many data samples may cause the model to overfit. Second, when using transformer learning, the impact of different size data side on model performance is not discussed. Third, we don't solve the problem of data imbalance. That's all. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Anthony Winman and my presentation is called Evaluating the Effectiveness of Inhaler Use Among COPD Patients Via Recording and Processing Cough and Breath Sounds from Smartphones. In this, in this presentation, I will start with the problem statement, then go to the motivation, related works, data collection, data pre-processing and tagging, MFCC audio features, support vector machine algorithm, results, importance of work, and future work. Chronic cough and wheezing are common symptoms of patients experiencing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. Chronic cough and wheezing both stem from a buildup of mucus in the lungs. In this study, I am proposing a machine learning based technique to detect symptoms of COPD via cough and breathing sounds. 
This will include ex the extraction of commonly used audio features and the implementation of audio manip manipulation techniques. This also includes developing of machine learning algorithms for supervised learning of audio data for classification. Chronic cough and wheezing from the lungs are main symptoms of COPD due to excess mucus buildup. To decrease the symptom severity, COPD patients are instructed to regularly self-medicate with an inhaler. However, a significant percentage of patients engage in suboptimal inhaler use. Consequently, mucus does not break down in their lungs, leading to exacerbated symptoms and oftentimes rehospitalization. The idea of this paper is to detect specifically the effectiveness of inhaler use by monitoring and analyzing cough and breath sounds before and after inhaler use. In related works in the category of analyzing cough for healthcare using machine learning, I, I found a system to detect symptoms of tuberculosis via cough sounds. This includes 38 subjects, 17 with tuberculosis, 21 without, the combination of a decision tree and a logistic regression classifier, which came out to a 82% accuracy, 95% sensitivity, 72% specificity, and a 0.95 under the area curve score. Analyzing cough for healthcare uh, in deep learning, I found systems to detect cough using deep learning techniques for big data. In these three systems, relatively small number of subjects, ranging from 9 to 14 subjects, were used. These, these systems use convolutional neural networks for classification of cough. About 95% accuracy for the CNN to correct to correctly classify cough sounds was produced uh, in these three systems. In the category of using breath analysis for healthcare, I found three systems which are machine learning algorithms designed to, design, to analyze breath te breathing techniques to differentiate patients with lung cancer from healthy patients and from a mixed group of patients with other lung diseases, such as COPD, asthma, pneumonia, and other diseases. Also, a system to detect various phases of breathing. Also, a, a system that just does a simple breath detection. In this system, I am presenting a system-based smartphone audio system that is simple, low-cost, and ubiquitous for COPD detection that is applicable for in-home use. So, the data collection. At the Tampa General Hospital in downtown Florida, we collaborated with registered nurses and nursing scientists who were able to help us find 55 clinically diagnosed patients, 34 female and 21 male. For each patient, we collected four samples from each subject. First, cough and breath sounds before they took their inhaler and cough and breath sounds after they took their inhaler. The medicine, which is the inhaler, takes about five minutes to settle before the inhaler use data could be collected. Patients also filled out a COPD ABC questionnaire, which measures burden of COPD and a Lester cough questionnaire, which measures impact of cough on various aspects of life, such as personal and professional. The technology used to collect this data was a custom recording application on a Motorola Moto E smartphone device. This device is, uses Android operating system version 4.4.4 KitKat and a sampling rate of 44,100 Hz and a bit rate of 16. We also use an Audio Techna ATR3350IS omnidirectional condenser laminar microphone to collect breath co for the breath collection process. So to collect the cough, patients were simply asked to cough into the microphone of the smartphone. However, to collect the breath data, we had to use an actual tethoscope and surface and screen several areas of the participant's chest and back area to find the best area where the wheezing could be heard. If you look at this figure on the top right, you will see that there are four different areas on the front chest and there are eight different areas on the, the back. And these areas were uh, screened to find the best location for oscillation. Birth sounds were collected using the Omnidirectional Conditioner Lavender microphone, which is connected to the smartphone, as you can see here on the right hand side at the bottom. Participants were asked to take five to seven deep breaths and we would pace place this microphone on their chest and that will be able to collect the data uh, from their lungs. And all of the data was stored into the phone. So this is a close up of the recording application um, that was used to collect the data. And here are some samples of the data that we collected in the process. 
So pre-processing and tagging. Data was sliced into one second windows where features were extracted from each window. As you can see on the right hand side, I have an example of a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease cough sample. Each, each second is sliced by, is, is represented by this black line. And from each second, I am extracting a number of different audio features. I also attempted different window sizes with this, including a 250 millisecond, 500 millisecond, and 750 millisecond um, windowing algorithm. However, I found that the one second algorithm worked best. During collection, there were different pauses that were picked up during collection. Also, different noises in the background, such as medical equipment, background conversations, outside construction. So in order to remove the pauses, I used an online audio cut application cutting software, which was used to cut out the pauses in, um, in each sample. Um, for the background noises, I used a, ba a bandpass filter, which I implemented in MATLAB, which was applied to remove additional noises from the background. The cutoff frequencies of the bandpass filter used were 300 hertz and 1200 hertz, since cough-related sounds primarily are in that range. So before pre-processing, I had cough before inhaler use, 289 seconds, breath before inhaler use, 627 seconds, cough after inhaler use, 261 seconds, breath after inhaler use, 632 seconds. After all of the pre-processing, I had cough before inhaler use, 219 seconds, breath before inhaler use, 579 seconds, cough after inhaler use, 211 seconds, and breath after inhaler use, 582 seconds. So, for sound recognition systems, the primary goal is to classify a sound, whether that sound be speech, singing, breath, cough, or etc., as produced by a human. The human sounds are produced via the larynx, which is the voice box and vibrations of the vocal cords. This sound is then filtered by the vocal tract, which determines how sound produced is both shaped and ejected from the mouth. The corresponding shape of the sound is defined within the spectral envelope of the short time spectrum, which estimates loudness and timbre. The male frequency sexual coefficients, also known as MFCC, are the strongest audio features capable of accurately defining that envelope. So this is a visual representation, representation of, the, of the previous slide. As you can see here, the throat area and the mouth area are in red, represent the vocal tract. The cough here, as you can see, there's a specific shape to the cough. And within that shape, there is an envelope of spectral time, envelope of short time spectrum that is represented, and it helps us to figure out the MFCC. So this sound type is produced by the shape of the vocal tract. The shape is defined within the envelope of the short time power spectrum, which is best characterized by the central coefficients of the MFCC. To calculate the MFCC, there are a multitude of steps required. First, we have to do framing. The first, the framing of 20, 20 milliseconds. If you do more, less than 20 milliseconds, you won't have enough samples for the spectral estimate. If you do more, there will be too many changes to signal, making it non-stationary. The next feature is a Hammond window, which cuts off additional noisy frequencies found within each frame. The next is the paragram estimate. It identifies which frequencies the given sample and frame that are similar to that of a human ear. Because the MFCC audio feature is a feature that captures the sound in the same way that humans hear sound. Next is the metal filter bank, which uses a triangular filter to capture the energy within the spectral envelope. Then we take the log of filter bank energies and compute the logarithm of values produced by the filter bank. Next, we calculate the discrete cosine transform of the log filter bank, and then we express that as an infinite number of points, which are the coefficients. Then we keep the lower 13 coefficients. This is because the lower 13 contain the strongest quality of information about the spectral envelope shape, and that's what we want. Now, we used, um, for this particular uh, system, there were four classes cough before inhaler use, cough after inhaler use, breath before inhaler use, and breath after inhaler use. So, because the, late, the data was linear, I decided to go with the support vector machine algorithm. In this, I attempted using all four classes in the algorithm. However, 
when I did that, I got very poor results. So what I did was I created two separate tests. I used uh, one test for cough before and after inhaler, and then a second test for breath before and after inhaler. And the reason why I use this is because the data is linear and the, mach the support vector machine was able to find a margin that was wide enough to give us a pretty good accuracies for our data. So as you can see here, I did classification based on tenfold cross-validation, where the training set was 55%, validation set was 10%, and the testing set was 35%. And all of the results you see here are best based on the testing of 35%. So as you can see, the support vector machine performed the best here with an accuracy of 79, a precision of 81, recall of 81, a sensitivity of 84, 0.52, a specificity of 77.61, and an F1 score of 81. Other algorithms also performed well. However, the support vector machine performed consistently better all the way around. Using classification of cough based on leave one out cross validation, uh, again, the support vector machine performed best. However, there were certain instances where other algorithms performed better. Support vector machine had the highest accuracy of 60.69, K nearest neighbor had the best precision of 82% and a recall of 82%. Random forest had the best sensitivity and specificity of 89 and 79.45, while K nearest neighbor also had the best F1 score of 81. Doing classification of breath based on tenfold cross validation, support vector machine once again consistently performed better, showing a accuracy of 84.49, a precision of 84, recall of 83, sensitivity of 83, specificity of 93.30. However, the K nearest neighbor algorithm showed a higher F1 score of 83. Lastly, classification of breath based on leave one out cross validation. You can see that the support vector machine showed an accuracy of 84.32, Precision of 83, recall of 83, sensitivity of 82, and a specificity of 91.49. However, you can see that the K nearest neighbor showed a higher F1 score, and the, the K nearest neighbor and random force showed a higher F1 score than that of the support vector machine. Here I have the ROC curves. So the ROC curves are based on true positive rate and the false positive rate. As you can see, support vector machine, whether it be cough before and after inhaler, breath before or after inhaler, and whether it be temporal cross-validation or leave one out cross-validation, the support vector machine consistently performed a little bit better than all of the other algorithms. As you can see here, we have the support vector machine performing at a 93.9% um, AUC. Um, next, we have support vector machine performing at a 9%. Uh, 92.6 AUC. Here we have it performing at 87.5 and here 88.4. So why is this work important? This work is important because modern day healthcare is making a steady transition towards smart health practices. Smart health is a combination of smart health of healthcare and smart and advanced technology such as machine learning and artificial intelligence used to improve the quality of healthcare. Also, it is used to improve uh, smart health can be used to improve patient and doctor health relationships. It is not intended to replace healthcare providers, but to aid them in making evidence-based decisions for treatment plans. So introduce the idea is to introduce a more personalized plan for each patient who suffers from COPD instead of patients that are, plans that are usually more general. And also it's used to um, increase patient convenience. This is especially important for patients who lack healthcare resources such as insurance or close proximity to hospital facilities, but may have access to a smartphone. In 2019, Pew Research reported that 96% of Americans have access to smartphone technology. So with that being said, if we were to take this, these algorithms and put them inside of a mobile application, there is a great chance that the overwhelming majority of people who suffer from COPD will have access to this technology. Studies show that life expectancy in most countries has significantly increased. The World Health Health Organization predicts that the senior citizen, senior citizen population, which are people who are over the age of 65, will outnumber children who are under the age of 13 by 2050. 
and COPD made majority affects senior citizen population. So if we're going to have a boom in the senior citizen population, we should definitely have technology in place that can be used to help them sustain their livelihood. So future works. Um, first, I want to add background noise to cough and breath samples to consider classification within a noisy environment, just to give it a little bit more of a realistic approach because most of the time patients will be using the algorithm or the app in settings which are not totally uh, noise free. Um, also, I want to develop an algorithm to distinguish amongst male and female cough sounds, uh, which may be harder to do with breath sounds, but the reason why is because there are studies that show that female COPD carriers have way harsher symptoms than male carrier COPD carriers. I also want to explore other, other diseases that have a symptom of cough, such as COVID-19 and asthma. I also want to use deep learning um, using public available audio, set, da uh, audio data sets as collecting the data for my own deep learning uh, will be a very strenuous task. I also want to use more state-of-the-art algorithms versus these traditional approaches that I've used in this uh, research. I want to examine relationships between respiratory diseases like COPD and asthma and COPD and tuberculosis. And lastly, I want to do application development via Android and iOS where I would deploy my machine learning algorithm into a server and into the app, allowing the app to uh, use the machine learning um, anywhere in be able to detect COPD wherever someone needs to be detected. These are the references for my research and for the paper for the references that are used within the within this presentation. And that is it. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Ronnie. And my name is Haim. We are here to present uh, to you our project, LookUp. So, what exactly is LookUp? LookUp system will provide a solution for real-time navigation in urban areas safely as possible and based on context awareness and IoT technologies. The problem. So, where did the idea came from? Well, in today's world, there is a big problem. Distractions and attention distribution while navigating between mobile phone and the road leads to an insecure experience. So, our goals. The first goal is arriving from point A to point B safely and adjust navigation capability for disabled people. The second goal is enabling the navigator to focus on the road and uh, reduce users' cognitive load. Okay, so let's talk about design. As part of our solution, we've created a smart bracelet, or as we like to call it, a, sa a safety outdoor assistant navigation solution. It's built with the basic components of Visual advisor, which is a basic overlay display. Left and right indicators, which are the vibration motors. On and off switch in order to preserve battery life. And our what's now button. A quick press on this baby will show the current navigation instruction calculated by your current location. The Bengal language. Here, here is a unique uh, vibration language we created for the smart bracelet. When you need to turn left, uh, you will feel three vibrations on the left side. And uh, when uh, you need to turn right, you will feel three vibrations on the right side. Between five and 20 meters before turning, uh, you will feel two vibrations depending on the side of the turn. Above 20 meters before turning, you will feel two vibrations depending on the side of the turn. Once you have to continue straight, you will feel uh, three short uh, vibrations on the right side or on the left side. When the navigation starts, uh, you will feel one long vibration 
on the left side and and on the right side. Also, when you will uh, finish the navigation, you will feel one long vibration on the left side and uh, on the right side. Now we will talk about the architecture. So, the general diagram in high level of the system is divided into before navigation and during navigation. The before navigation process uh, is about the user, the user uh, that turns to track planner and creates a new track or selects an existing track. Uh, after this, a reference is sent to the track builder according to the user profile. Then the track builder builds the track for him. The track builder turns an external service to receive the map and transfer the information to local device storage. Now we will talk about the uh, second part, the during navigation. Uh, location indication is uh, streamed from the internal storage to the context awareness analyzer that displays the information on the phone screen and activates a vibration in the navigation bracelet according to the following request. Now we will share with you a short demo of how it really works. So, regarding the architecture of the embedded component, it's based on an Arduino Pro Mini chip with a 3.7 volt battery, a basic 0.96 inch OLED screen, and an HC08 Bluetooth device which supports Bluetooth version 4.0. The system model consists of a web application and three main models. Now we will talk about the models. The track planner module uh, with which the system communicates, the builder that is responsible for building the tracks and interfacing with the databases and the external services. And uh, the last one is the track navigator that's responsible for navigating and streaming data in real time to the user that uses the mobile and the smart band. Okay, in this slide, you can see that user requests are uh, transferred to the track planner. Once the user has entered the request, uh, the information, the request is tra transferred as a JSON to the track planner, uh, track builder. From there, the track builder performs an API call in front of Google that provides the information needed for the track. Depending on the user's choice, the information is saved or retrieved from the databases and moved as a track object to the track navigator, which is responsible for the conduct of the entire navigation process.
Moving on to the infrastructure and coding language. So our client side, basically our web app is based on React. Our server side is based on Node.js. We have uh, an implementation which uses Google Maps API in order to receive validated and reliable data. Our data is saved as a JSON format in a MongoDB storage. Our whole infrastructure is based on AWS, which hosts our servers. And uh, regarding our endpoint technology, which is the embedded component, we've used an Arduino uh, microprocessor and a BLA version uh, 4.0 in order to send and receive data. Validation process. In order to provide a safe solution for one of the main problems during navigation, before a route is created, its waypoints are undergoing a customized validation process fitted to the user's profile. For example, a child riding to school on his kick scooter is in need of a safe route while avoiding any main routes. Or, for example, a disabled person is in need of a route without any stairs. After a producer has built his or her track, the data is then transferred onto the track builder model. From there, there is a series of processes which includes a real-time validation of the route's waypoints with Google Maps API. This process occurs in order to make sure that the route build is needed applicable, safe, and free of obstacles. Furthermore, Users with disabilities are only presented with routes that are fitted to their profile. If a user builds a custom route, the system will alert him or her that there is an obstacle that needs to be considered. Okay, first the producer sends the track data that's selected by the user to the track planner. Then the track planner performs in-depth validation for the uh, for each uh, one of the waypoints. If the validation process fails, the producer received a warning. If the validation process is successful, the track builder creates the track for us by contacting the context awareness analyzer directly and returns the prepared track to the producer. Now the customer can then load the track and start navigating. Okay, so below is our future planning. Uh, the first one is using the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, the second one is uh, track suggestions by user profile and navigation history. Another one is a uh, reroute while navigating. And uh, another one is uh, build an offline mode navigation. Moving on to our innovation in the current solution. Number one is a user-friendly smart browser. The smart browser is easy to operate without any extra functionality that is unneeded in this device. Secondly, there is a unique straightforward vibration language which is also customizable. Third is the affordable price. The price and the total cost for this product is not very high. Four, server navigation experience while disabling any distraction from a mobile device. All non-related notifications and calls are not being transferred into the smart bracelet. Thus allowing us to focus only on our, our navigation process. And number five, the support for variety of different populations such as children, disabled population and cyclists. Each user profile can be created as one of the above in order to get only the relevant content for him. That way, our system can take into consideration his limitations or preferences. Conclusions. To find if the use of IoT improves safe navigation for kick scooters, this study defines major non-functional and functional requirements. Moreover, the comprehensive product provides an amb uh, ambiguous application, which gives kick scooters the ability to safely navigate by reducing distractions. The solution was designed as a smart wearable product. Also, 
the core functional requirement was to allow the user to produce information in advance and consume it in real time. Attention to external distributions was minimized during navigation. The first issue is vibration language. The conclusion from uh, the analysis of the results is that signaling only no one side on one side. The first issue is vibration language. The conclusion from the analysis of the result is that signaling only on one side does not allow defining a rich language for real-time navigation. The second issue refers to the technical alternatives. After examining related location-based solution and examining context awareness application, the conclusion was to combine the two methods, location-based and context awareness, into an integrative solution using a smart band with the smartphone. Data transfers between the two devices stored in the cloud and analyzed for learning and improvement. In addition, enhancing the application with options to pre-produce routes, save favorite routes, enable both automatic and custom creation of routes, enrich the solution for the users in real-time situations. If you have any more questions, feel free to contact us at our email address. Thank you for listening, stay safe. Dear audience, it is my honor to have the chance to address you on this special occasion. The topic of my paper is an improved spectral clustering algorithm using fast dynamic time warping for power load curve analysis. Next, I will illustrate my article in these four aspects. The first part is research background. The second part is method. The third part is result. And the last part is paper conclusion. First, the background. With the continuous and steady development of the social economy, the power load curve has grown rapidly. In recent years, there has been a phenomenon of power shortage appears in many areas of China during the peak period of power consumption. At the same time, the traditional method of increasing investment in power generation is not economical enough. Alleviating peak power is in shortages by exploiting the demand side. Resources has received more attention. At present, China's electricity market is not yet complete, and the demand side management mainly adopts extensive and orderly electricity consumption mode, lacking of serious consideration of load form and low satisfaction with electricity consumption. Therefore, the cluster analysis of power load test data is the cornerstone of the demand side management and even overall planning of the entire power system. This article addresses three issues in the definition of a standardized model. The first is to propose a time series load clustering algorithm, which is helpful to improve the prediction accuracy in high dimension space. The second is to use the improved algorithm to cluster the load and then design a loaded prediction model suitable for this feature. The third is to adjust the electricity price according to the load prediction model, which is of great significance to the safety, economy, and stable operation of the power system. In this paper, a clustering algorithm combining the selection of internal similarity metrics in spectral clustering with AP neighbor propagation is proposed, which can automatically determine the clustering center and effectively avoid falling into local optimization. The fast DTWAP improved spectral clustering algorithm is applied to thousands of households, and 12 standard power modes those are obtained through the extraction of users' consumption habits and patterns. I currently grasp the law of electricity consumption. 
On this basis, a more effective electricity price is designed to adjust the residents' demand. The method, in order to study the role of similarity measure in power time series clustering analysis, Euclidean distance (DTW) and bus (DTW) are used as similarity measures in the application of spectral clustering, and the final clustering results are analyzed and compared reasonably. Euclidean distance is the most commonly used distance measurement method. It measures the absolute distance between two power series curves, but it can only measure the time series of the same length. However, the power time series curve generated by power load in the actual power generation process is disordered, so Euclidean distance is difficult to predict whether there is a similar trend between the two power time series, as shown in the figure. The local peaks of the curves U and V of the power time series do not match, which is caused by the fact that the Euclidean distance can only match the two series point to point. To solve this problem, we introduced a dynamic time warping algorithm. DTW is a nonlinear measure of the minimum distance between two power time series curves. As can be seen from the figure, point I in the power time series curve U can be well aligned, aligned with point J in the series V. The curve integration path starts from the start point 1-1, corresponding to the two sequences, and ends at the end point absolute value U and V, corresponding to the two sequences. However, the DTW algorithm also has of viewers defects in the actual power curve analysis, that is, the algorithm complexity is too high on the basis of fully ensuring the accuracy of the algorithm. A reasonable solution is provided for the clustering analysis of power curves with large amount of data in practical application. The fast dynamic time warping algorithm is a kind of acceleration algorithm for the classical dynamic time warping algorithm. The algorithm combines two methods, limited search space and data abstraction. On the basis of fully ensuring the accuracy of the algorithm, it provides a reasonable solution for the clustering analysis of power curve with large amount of data in practical application. The algorithm complexity of the three similarity measures in, is shown in the table. DTW can match different power time series curve, but the algorithm complexity is high. The first DTW algorithm not only meets the needs of unical, unequal length power time series curve, but also reduces the complexity of the algorithm. The, the main idea of spectral clustering is to transform all the power data into points in space. These points can be connected by edges. The edge weight value between the two points with a long distance is lower, while the edge weight value between the two points with a short distance is higher. By cutting the graph composed of all data points, the edge weight between different subgraphs after cutting is as low as possible, and the edge weight sum within the subgraph is as high as possible, so as to achieve the purpose of clustering. There are obvious disadvantages when using original spectral clustering for cluster analysis. Firstly, the cluster center cannot be determined automatically. Secondly, the final clustering effect is largely affected by the similarity matrix and the feature vector clustering algorithm. Thirdly, it is very sensitive to the choice of clustering parameters. 
In spectrum clustering, k means algorithm is used to cluster the eigenvector vector space. However, k means algorithm is very sensitive to the selection of the initial clustering center, and its hill climbing optimization algorithm often fails to obtain the global optimal optimal solution. So the affinity propagation AP algorithm is introduced. The AP algorithm is a clustering algorithm based on information transfer between data points. The algorithm does not need to determine the number of cluster before running it. In addition, because the actual points in the data set are selected, the clustering effect is better with the cluster center as the representative of each class. The selection of the appropriated clustering center is crucial to the quality of the final clustering effect. In order to find the maximum value, it is necessary to inter actively update the R and A values to obtain the most suitable cluster center. The termination condition of interaction is that the cluster center is not updated to a center extent or reaches the maximum number of iterations, generally 15 times. After getting the most suitable cluster center, the data set can be classified directly. In order to extract the standardized model of power time series accurately and effectively, more reliable clustering analysis results are obtained. In this paper, a fast DTWAP spectral clustering algorithm is proposed based on the original spectral clustering by analyzing the number of clusters. The inherent shortcomings of spectral clustering algorithm are soft which makes the algorithm not only suitable for arbitrary shape simple space clustering, but also can effectively prevent the algorithm from falling into the local optimal phenomenon. In addition, the improved algorithm has better performance in processing unequal length power time series curves, which fully guarantees the similarity of shape and contour of power time series curves, and its performance is far better than that in processing high dimensional data and sparse data clustering. The results. The clustering quality evaluation index is divided into external evaluation index and internal evaluation index. Among them, the external evaluation index is to apply to apply the clustering algorithm to the standard test data set with clear classification and then calculate the clustering accuracy of the algorithm to the data set with relevant indexes while the internal indicators refer to predefined evaluation criteria, which are usually used to describe some intrinsic characters and uh, quantitative values of clustering after clustering in order to evaluate the quality of clustering results. The adjusted clustering method was evaluated by using the adjusted method Mutual information, AMI, and the adjusted RAND index, ARI, as external standards for evaluating the quality of clustering. In order to better evaluate the clustering effect of the algorithm, the sum of the squares due to error, SSE, is used as the internal standard to evaluate the clustering quality. As can be seen from the comparison results in figure, the improved fast DTW AP spectral clustering algorithm has significantly improved the performance of AMI and ARI indexes, indicating that the algorithm proposed in this paper has higher feeding accuracy for time series and can better realize the classification of data set. 
as Euclidean distance was used as the similarity measure in the original spectral clustering, it could not match the unequal time series. Therefore, compared with the traditional spectral clustering algorithm, the AMI and ARI evaluation indexes of the fast DTWAP spectral clustering algorithm were improved by 16.2% and 18.4% respectively. Since AP algorithm has better processing effect than K-means algorithm in dealing with complex time series compared with both DTW and K-means combined algorithm, AMI and the ARI of both the DTW AP spectral clustering algorithm are improved by 7.1% and 8.6% respectively. Compared with combination algorithm of DTW algorithm and AP algorithm, AMI and ARI of fast DTW AP spectral clustering algorithm increased respectively 6.4% and 7.3%, which is because fast DTW solves the problem of excessive regularity of DTW. As can be seen from the table, the SSE index value of the improved first DTW AP spectral clustering algorithm is lower than the other three comparison algorithms, and the intra cluster variance is closer to one, which indicates that the improved first DTW AP spectral clustering algorithm has achieved excellent clustering results. At the same time, it is noted that the intra-class variance of this algorithm is closer to the result of standard data. Experimental results show that the proposed algorithm has better performance in processing time series. Finally, the actual efficiency of the algorithm is verified by using actual energy consumption data from the Energy Council, CER. In this paper, the power data set is proposed, uh, including deleting users who lose data, deleting data that is not suitable for analysis near zero, and using minimum maximum normalization to map the data uniformly to the interval zero to one. Finally, 12 types of the time load curve standardized models were obtained. For each clustering result, a power load curve is drawn as the figure. And a typical load curve is extracted by taking time as the abscissa and the electricity load power as the ordinate. In, the, in this way, the electricity consumption curve the blue line and the typical load curve, the red line of each household can be obtained so as to accurately extract the combination and the difference of the load. Lastly, the conclusions. In order to effectively extract valuable information from power data, optimize power dispatch, and regulate the operation of the entire power grid, this paper proposed this a uh, fast DTWAP improved spectral clustering algorithm based on time series. The main conclusions are summarized as follows. First, the external index of AMI, AMI and ARI and the index internal of SSE was used to evaluate the clustering results of the fast DTWAP improved spectral clustering algorithm and other three time series clustering methods. The spectral clustering algorithm can effectively retain the morphological and the contour similarities between the time series. Second, in order to further prove the raw 
robustness and the practical visibility of BUST DTWAP improved the spectral clustering algorithm. It is found that the external evaluation indexes AMI and ARI are significantly improved compared with the other two commonly used data mining algorithms. Third, the fast DTWAP spectral clustering algorithm was tested on SCCTS, AAW, and CER of Irish smart meter. Multiple experimental results show that the fast DTWAP improved spectral clustering algorithm has achieved the best performance. Fast DTWAP spectral clustering algorithm has certain advantages compared to other clustering algorithms when proposing time series. Thanks for your listening.
Research on Text Statement Analysis Based on Attention CMGU. The paper has five parts. Part 1, Introduction. Part 2, Recurrent Neural Network with Gate Structure. Part 3, Statement Analysis Model. Based on Attention CMGU. Part 4, Experimental Analysis. Part 5, Conclusions. Part 1, Introduction. With the widespread application of the Internet, the Internet has generated a large number of user-engaged command information with emotional factors such as people, events, and products. Recording various life states in the form of text to express emotions and attitudes has occupied an increasingly important position in people's daily communication and the carrier of motion through the study of network text information is possible to analyze the emotional changes of network users, understand the selection preferences of network users from multiple aspects, and better understand the behaviors of network users. In order to understand the emotion in the text, the emotions need to be classified the purpose is to classify the emotion into positive, negative emotions or more detailed emotion categories. Exiting sentiment analysis methods are mainly divided into two categories as on sentimental dictionary, matching methods, and machine learning based methods. As deep learning has gradually become a research hard part in the field of natural language processing, the technology of using deep learning methods based on sentiment dictionary matching to solve sentiment analysis problems has also developed rapidly. Many scholars have optimized the sentiment characteristics of text test text sentiment analysis. In the study of sentiment analysis based on machine learning, because deep learning has the advantages of local feature, abstraction, and memory function. It can avo avoid a large number of artificial feature extraction and other advantages. Research has applied deep uh, Apply deep neural network based text classification method to set met analysis, the most popular of which are CNN and RNN models. CNN, RNN, and other neural networks have achieved good results in the field of statement analysis in natural language processing, but there are still some problems. In order to solve the, this series of problems, many neural network variants such as the LSTM and the GRU have been proposed successfully and have been successfully applied in the field of statement analysis. LSTM is able to memorize the context of a sequence, which are which have has obvious advantages for advantages for the emotional feature extraction of text sequences and can solve the problem of vanishing gradients as a <coughs> and the variant of LSTM. GRU has a simpler structure than LSTM with fewer parameters and a faster convergence and can solve the problem of long distance dependence in the latest text classification research. It's found that compared with GRU, the smallest gated unit MGU and the advantage of simpler structure, fewer parameters, and less training time. It's very suitable for tasks with strong time dependence while using fewer parameters 
the NGO model can reduce the workload of selecting parameters and improve the generalization ability of the model. The MGO model does not fully learn the sequence related features such as the sequence in which the text is generated in time. The convolutional neural network CNN can extract, extract the features of the data through convolution operations and can enhance certain features of the original data and uh, reduce the noise. When a similar human uh, when a similar human brain recognizes a picture, it does not recognize the whole picture and when once, but it first perceives this each feature in the picture first and then integrates the parts at a higher level operation to get global information. The attention mechanism is a resource allocation mechanism that is at a certain time. Your attention is always focused on a fixed position on the screen without paying attention to other parts. Therefore, in this paper, a new attention CMGU model is proposed by combining the network structure of CNN and the minimum Getty Unit MGU and introducing the attention mechanism. This model combines the convolutional layer and the smallest Getty Unit MGU in CNN with a unified architecture and ends the attention mechanism between the convolutional layer and the MGU layer. The new model not only reflects the advantages of the CNN model and the smallest gated unit MGU, but also uses the attention mechanism to further optimize the thematic feature representation. The experimental results show that the new model can not only highlight the key information of the text, but also my richer thematics and has a better performance in the sentiment classification of the text. Part 2. Recurrent Neural Network with Gate Structure RN has been prompt to be very successful in the field of natural language processing in practice. But when faced uh, with long sequence of text, the gradient of the hidden layer variables of RNN may attenuate or explode. LSTM memory unit is based on the RNN memory unit with the gate control mechanism. It's Structure is shown in Figure 1. Because there are more learning parameter settings in LSTM and longer training time, GRU is proposed as an improved version of LSTM. Compared with LSTM, the GRU has one less gated unit and fewer parameters, so the computing time and convergence speed are greatly improved. Its structure is shown in figure 2. The minimum gated unit, unit MGU is a simplified recurrent neural network structural unit. <coughs> the gate number is the smallest in any gated unit and there is only one forget gate. The gate is merged into the forget gate. The structure is shown in figure 3 and can be seen from the structure diagram of the MGU. The structure of the MGU is obviously simpler than that of the LSTM and the GRU. The LSTM has four sets of parameters to be defined, and the GRU needs three sets of parameters, but the MGU only needs two sets of parameters in the getting unit. The 
the retro neural network has a simpler structure, fewer parameters, and a faster training. <coughs> Part 3. Statement analysis model based on attention CMGO. Combining the respective advantages of CN and MGO in order to achieve the goal of text segmental analysis. This paper proposes a network structure that combines CN with the smallest gating unit MGU and introduces the attention mechanism. The model structure is shown in Figure 4. The specific process of the model structure proposed in this paper is Firstly, capture the preliminary feature representation of the text through the CNN's convolution layer, and then use the attention mechanism and the MGU model to obtain the deep feature of the text with keyword discrimination in the hidden layer of the MGU indicates that the state of the Hidden layer is then finally input to the softmax layer for regression classification processing to complete the classification processing of the text convolution layer feature extraction. The first mod module of this model is to extract the preliminary feature representation of the text through the convolutional layer in CN by defining the Region vector RSV to maintain the original sequence corresponding to the input sentence. The MGU model of the speci specified sequence input provides a reasonable input. The purpose of using the convolution layer in this model is to ensure a reasonable sequence vector and the input vector for subsequent MGUs. The pooling layer will destroy the original word order of the original sentence and cannot be used as a reasonable input for the MGU. So only the convolution layer is used. Attention layer. The attention mechanism simulates the attention model of the human brain. For example, when we admire the Painting, we can see the whole picture, but when we look closely, the glasses focus on only a small part. The main concern lands on this small pattern. That is, when there is a certain wide differentiation, the human brain's attention to the entire painting is not balanced. The attention mechanism is the mechanism that highlights local important <coughs> information by assigning sufficient attention to key information. In the model proposed in this paper, each, uh, each output element is obtained by clicking the formula. The semantic, the semantic coding formed by the attention mechanism will be used as the input of the MGO module. MGO layer. After the attention mechanism, this paper uses a simplified re recurrent network <coughs> structural unit, namely the smallest gate unit MGO, compared with LSTM and GRU MGR, uh, MGO has fewer parameters, simpler structure, and faster convergence. Through the above model, a deep level feature representation of the text can be obtained. Finally, softmax, softmax is used to perform regression to obtain the final text classification result. Part 4. Experimental analysis. For the sentiment, for the sentiment classification task, the publicly used IMBDB and the sentimental 
140 datasets are selected in this paper. This article uses uh, about two dates set for pre-training after word segmentation and the processing of the above corpus. The word vector is trained using word to vector. This experiment <coughs> uses the Keras deep learning framework. The bottom layer is TensorFlow. The TensorFlow platform integrates CNNRN and uh, LSTM, GRU, MGU, and other deep learning models. It is implemented using Python programming. Parameter setting compression experiment. The word Victor is a more important text processing task. Its dimension directly affects the, the classification accuracy of the model. We can see the IMBD dataset is shown in figure 5. After that mining the set of the word Victor, the choice of model iterations in this article is also explained through experiments. The number of iterations is the number of times the entire training set is trained, and the number of iterations increases. The results of the network model gradually approach the optimal. When the number of iterations exceeds a certain number of times, it will lead to overfitting and reduce the generalization ability of the model. Attention mechanism affects experiments. The <coughs> experimental results are shown in figure 7. Part 5. Conclusions. This paper proposes a CMGO-based hybrid neural network model by pro performing Settlement analysis experiments on AIMBD film review data and uh, settlement 140 data. It uh, compared accuracy and F1 values with other mainstream text classification methods. Compared with GRU and LSTM, MGU has certain advantages in the field of text settlement analysis due to its advantages such as small calculation amount and fast convergence speed. In the next research week work, we will carry out research in the following aspects. In the research of this paper, there are only two types of emotional polarity, positive and negative. The classification of emotion is not refined, and the issue of emotional intensity is not considered. During data processing, some data with only emojis or not only pictures and no text descriptions were discarded, which could not be comprehensively and analyzed from multiple which caused some limitations to the model. The next step will be in-depth research in sentiment and analysis of multi-model text. That's all. Th thanks for watching. Hello everyone, I'm the author of Inception Model of Convolutional Autoencoder for Image Denosing. 
I'm going to explain the four parts of my paper, including introduction, network structure of convolutional autoencoder, experiments and results, epilog. First, let's start from the introduction. With the rapid development of computer technology and internet technology, people's daily life is full of all kinds of information. According to the investigation and research, among all the ex external information obtained by human beings, vision system accounts for more than 70%. So the acquisition, processing, and use of image information is particularly important. Image denosing is an important research topic in the field of image processing. While removing the noise, we try to keep the important information in the image. Digital image processing can be generally divided into space-based processing and transform-based processing. The, de the, de -no the denoising method based on the spatial domain is to operate on the gray space of the original image and process the gray value of the pixel directly. The common methods include mean filter, media filter, and image denoising based on partial differential. Medium filter can effectively filter salt and paper noise, and mean filter is suitable for filtering Gaussian noise. The denoising method based on transform domain is to transform the, soul, the source image first, such as the Fourier transform, wavelet transform, and so on. Subsequent paragraphs, however, are intended. At present, many image denoising methods have been proposed by scholars at home and abroad. At present, the BM3G algorithm with better denoising effect is to divide the image into blocks of certain size, merge the blocks with, sim with similar characteristics into three-dimensional arrays, process these three-dimensional arrays by three-dimensional filtering method and obtain, the, and obtain the denoised image by inverse transformation. Schuller and others put forward multi-layer per perceptron measure, which uses image processing and multi-layer perceptron through the uh, combination of network learning model. The algorithm proposed by Berger uses MLP in image denoising. Proposed TNRD model expanded sparse coding and iterative methods into forward feedback network and achieved good image denoising effect. In recent years, research shows that as a typical representative of deep learning, autoencoder is mainly used to learn the compression and distributed feature expression of given data through the unsupervised learning, so as to reconstruct the input data based on the autoencoder. Researchers have derived a variety of autoencoders. Hinton and others improved the original shallow structure, proposed the inception and training strategy of deep learning neural network, and then produced the denoing autoencoder. In 2007, Benjo proposed the inception of sparse autoencoder. In addition, there are MGA and, and SSGA. In this paper, a neural network denoising model based on a convolutional autoencoder is used to speed up the operation speed of the network. This network model has changes in the size of convolution layer. The inception model is used to expand the network wise to better extract noise image features. The network structure of the improved inception deconvolution model is used. Batch normalization and random inactivation are used to prevent auto overfitting. The length and width of the convolution layer are inversely proportional to the number of feature maps, which greatly reduces the number of network parameters. The dataset uses VOC 2012 
due to the huge content due to the huge content of the data set, 1,000 pictures are randomly selected as the training set, 700 of which are used as the training set, and 300 pictures are used as the test set. Classical image data is used for comparative experiments. It is proved by experiments that an algorithm structure in this paper is more robust to denoising and has better denoising effect. Next, I will introduce the network structure of convolutional autoencoder. The, the um, Gaussian noise is a kind of random noise which accords with normal distribution, and it is also the most common noise distribution. The, form the formula is shown in here. Finally, the value of image the value of image pixel after noise is added into the formula to limit, so as to avoid data overflow. In this paper, we use the Gaussian noise data set with noise level of 25 to denote the data. As shown in Figure 1, we can see the difference between the noise image, not the noisy image, and the original image. In this paper, we remove the image noise based on the noise level 25. This paper uses two-layer inception model to process noise image. This brings another problem. The number of feature maps in each layer increases, and the cost of computation increases greatly. Therefore, this paper makes the following settings for the inception model. Each convolution layer of inception is added to the ReLU activation function, which simplifies the calculation process. The dispersion of activity makes the calculation cost of inception model decrease. Add BN and randomly and random deactivation layer. BN layer can uh, BN layer can accelerate the training speed of inception network many times, improve the generalization ability of the network, normalize the output of normal distribution of N01, reduce the distribution of internal neurons, accelerate the training speed, and produce more stable nonlinear output. In the experiment, it is found that the training peak signal-to-noise ratio is not stable when only BN layer operates, and the problem of non-data state and non-verification -ver state is considered after that. The dropout layer is used to solve the overfitting phenom phenomenon in the model training process. The results show that the dropout layer can reduce the peak signal-to-noise ratio instability. In dropout learning process, part of the weight or output hidden layer is randomly zeroed to reduce the interdependence between nodes. In order to make the denoising network model be able to process natural images, the data of each image is transformed into a three-dimensional matrix. The convolutional autoencoder is divided into two parts, decoder and encoder. There are four layers in total. The structure of the convolutional autoencoder denoising network based on the inception model is shown in, in the figure. The advantage of the network is that it uses autoencoder structure, encoder, and deencoder of coding layer. The first two layers of Inception ver version 3, classic structure in encoder and deconvolutional model in decoder. The advantage of this model is that it can restore the noise image features extracted from the encoder to a greater extent. In extent, and it can restore the original image features better than one layer deconvolution. Due to the time, the specific network settings will not be detailed. In 
In conclusion, in order to improve the robot, robot, robust of image denoising, the convolution operation of the inception model is introduced to improve the convolutional operation in the inception model. Better future extraction of noise image use the ReLU function to prevent the gradient from disappearing. Introduce BN and dropout operation to prevent network overfitting. Improve the overall denoising performance of the model and shorten the training time. The flow of image denoising using network is shown in the figure. With the increase of training times, the, ver the verification stage is used to evaluate whether the model is overfitted. The specific operation is set the number of no nodes to 500. After training, and after training the corresponding parameters through the training set, the verification set is used to detect the error of the model and then change the number of nodes. If the error of the model is greater than 100% or less, one, less than 0%, Stop the network immediately and make corresponding modification. The third part is experiments and results. First, I will introduce the experimental data. In the, ex in the image denoising experiment based on convolutional autoencoder, VOC 2012 data set is very large, so 1,000 of them are randomly selected as data sets. 700 of them are training sets and 300 are test sets. At the same time, 10 standard images commonly used in the field of image denoising are used as reference image for for comparative experiments. All the images are all the images in VOC 2012 are color images, while the gray image is used in this paper. Therefore, it is necessary to convert the color image into gray image and add Gaussian noise with noise level of 25. In order to facilitate facilitate training, the input image is cut into 20 by 20 sub image blocks and the cut out image is stored in an H5 file. Every five original images, which is convenient for model reading and training. The experimental environment system is configured as Windows 10 system. The processor is Intel Core i7-3370 I3, CPU. And the memory is 8 gigabytes. Peak to signal, peak signal to noise ratio and structural similarity are used as noise redu reduction evaluation indexes. The influence of inception model on noise reduction, reducing, reduction performance. In this paper, the network uses the inception model to extract the features of images, and in order to show the feature extraction ability of multiple inception structures in this paper. The common convolutional autoencoder, one, la one layer of inception model and multiple inception models in this paper are used for peak, to peak signal to noise ratio comparison. The experimental results are shown in the figure. After 500 times of training, it can be seen from the figure from figure 4 that the peak signal to noise ratio value of the algorithm in this paper keeps rising during the training process up to 25 dB or more, while the initial stage of the ordinary convolutional autoencoder is poor and it slowly drops in the early stage of the sudden rise and later stage, and finally it is about 19 dB. The first layer of inception rises slowly after the fluctuation in the early stage, and finally it is about 21 dB. The two-layer inception model used in this paper is superior to the other two methods from the beginning, and finally it is gentle at about 23 dB. From the experimental results, we can see that the more training times, the better stability and robust of this algorithm. It shows 
better denoting results. The influence of the deconvolution of a model of inception on the performance of denoting. In this paper, we use the inception de deconvolution of two feedback and extract features. Compare the influence of one layer deconvolution and inception deconvolution model on image denoting. The experimental results are shown in the figure. From the figure, it can be seen that the ordinary one layer deconvolutional deconvolution in the early training is relatively stable, while the inception deconvolution model fluctuates briefly. In the later training, the effect of using inception model is better than that of the ordinary one-layer deconvolution, and the final stability is about 24 GB. The overall e effect is very good when using the inception deconvolution model. In order to verify the robot robust of the method in this paper. Ten classic, te test. Ten classic test images are selected for simulation experiment and compared with the literature 12, literature 3, and literature 15, as shown in table 1 and table 2. Table 1 is the peak signal-to-noise ratio of 10 images, and table 2 is the structural similarity of each method. Both literature 12 and literature 13 use deep convolution neural network for image denoising. As shown in table 1 and table 2, the algorithm in this paper shows good denoising effect with an average increase of peak, to peak signal to noise ratio by 11.088 and SSIM by 0 0.451 compared with the original image. Literature 12 and literature 13 use five-layer deep convolution neural network. The difference is that the first three layers of literature 12 are convolutions. The last two layers are anti-convolutions, and literature 13 uses five convolutions to denote. Compared with literature 12 and literature 13, Peak signal to noise ratio and SSIM increased by 2.813 and 0.821, respectively, and 5% and 1.9%, respectively. In reference 14, the peak signal to noise ratio and SSIM were increased by 2.626 percentage and 1.1%. Percent, respectively, under the same experimental environment by using one layer inception model and five layer inception uh, and five layer convolution layer. Select five of the images for output com comparison. The comparison feature figure is shown in the figure. The image in this paper has a good visual effect and a clear edge. Through the details, it can be seen that the denoising algorithm in this paper has a good effect and the details are processed in place, showing the image after denoising more clearly. Now finally, the first part, epilogue. The algorithm of this paper adopts the structure of convolutional autoencoder using coding layer and decoding layer structure to clearly divide the network into two parts. Among them, the coding layer uses multiple inception models for feature extraction, and the decoding layer improves the traditional inception model, modifying the convolution, no, the convolution network into a deconvolution network, so that the image can make full use of the advantage of inception model feature extraction in the deconvolution network, better integrate image features, restore original image information. From the experimental results, it can show good robust in an image denoising. 
However, there are also differences. Compared with the convolutional neural network and the convolutional autoencoder without, without the inception model, the four-layer network proposed by the algorithm of this paper takes a long time. After prelim Preliminary. After preliminary experimental tests, it is known that the use of the inception model causes the, the network to become wider, and the volume of the cumulative neural network has experienced more operations. So how to shorten the model training time is the focus, is, is the focus of future research. Thank you for listening.